Diodorus Siculus. Library of History, Book One, Beginning. It is fitting that all men should ever accord great gratitude to those writers who have composed universal histories, since they have aspired to help by their individual labors human society as a whole, for by offering a schooling which entails no danger in what is advantageous they prove their readers, through such a presentation of events, with a most excellent kind of experience. For although the learning which is acquired by experience in each separate case, with all the attendant toils and dangers, does indeed enable a man to discern in each instance where utility lies. And this is the reason why the most widely experienced of our heroes suffered great misfortunes before he, of many men the cities saw and learned, their thoughts, yet the understanding of the failures and successes of other men which is acquired by the study of history, affords a schooling that is free from actual experience of ills. Furthermore, it has been the aspiration of these writers to marshal all men, who, although united one to another by their kinship, are yet separated by space and time, into one and the same orderly body. And such historians have therein shown themselves to be, as it were, ministers of divine providence. For just as providence, having brought the orderly arrangement of the visible stars and the natures of men together into one common relationship, continually directs their courses through all eternity, apportioning to each that which falls to it by the direction of fate, so likewise the historians, in recording the common affairs of the inhabited world as though they were those of a single state, have made of their treatises a single reckoning of past events and a common clearing house of knowledge concerning them. For it is an excellent thing to be able to use the ignorant mistakes of others as warning examples for the correction of error, and, when we confront the varied vicissitudes of life, instead of having to investigate what is being done now to be able to imitate the successes which have been achieved in the past. Certainly, all men prefer in their counsels the oldest men to those who are younger, because of the experience which has accrued to the former through the lapse of time. But it is a fact that such experience is in so far surpassed by the understanding which is gained from history, as history excels. We know in the multitude of facts at its disposal. For this reason one may hold that the acquisition of a knowledge of history is of the greatest utility for every conceivable circumstance of life, for it endows the young with the wisdom of the aged, while for the old it multiplies the experience which they already possess. Citizens in private station it qualifies for leadership, and the leaders it incites. Through the immortality of the glory which it confers to undertake the noblest deeds, soldiers, again, it makes more ready to face dangers in defense of their country because of the public encomiums which they will receive after death. And wicked men it turns aside from their impulse towards evil through the everlasting opprobrium to which it will condemn them. In general, then, it is because of that commemoration of goodly deeds which history accords men that some of them have been induced to become the founders of cities, that others have been led to introduce laws which encompass man's social life with security and that many have aspired to discover new sciences and arts in order to benefit the race of men. And since complete happiness can be attained only through the combination of all these activities, the foremost meed of praise must be awarded to that which more than any other thing is the cause of them, that is, to history. For we must look upon it as constituting the guardian of the high achievements of illustrious men, the witness which testifies to the evil deeds of the wicked, and the benefactor of the entire human race. For if it be true that the myths which are related about Hades, in spite of the fact that their subject matter is fictitious, contribute greatly to fostering piety and justice among men, how much more must we assume that history, the prophetess of truth, she who is, as it were, the mother city of philosophy as a whole, is still more potent to equip men's characters for noble living? For all men, by reason of the frailty of our nature, live but an infinitesimal portion of eternity and are dead throughout all subsequent time, and while in the case of those who in their lifetime have done nothing. Worthy of note, everything which has pertained to them in life also perishes when their bodies die, yet in the case of those who by their virtue have achieved fame, their deeds are remembered forevermore, since they are heralded abroad by history's voice most divine. Now it is an excellent thing, methinks, as all men of understanding must agree, to receive in exchange for mortal labors and immortal fame. In the case of Heracles, for instance, it is generally agreed that during the whole time which he spent among men he submitted to great and continuous labors and perils willingly. 
in order that he might confer benefits upon the race of men, and thereby gain immortality, and likewise in the case of other great and good men. Some have attained to heroic honors and others to honors equal to the divine, and all have been thought to be worthy of great praise, since history immortalizes their achievements. For whereas all other memorials abide but a brief time, yet the power of history, which extends over the whole inhabited world, possesses in time, which brings ruin upon all things else, a custodian which ensures its perpetual transmission to posterity. History also contributes to the power of speech, and a nobler thing than that may not easily be found. For it is this that makes the Greeks superior to the barbarians, and the educated to the uneducated, and, furthermore, it is by means of speech alone that one man is able to gain ascendancy over the many, and, in general, the impression made by every measure that is proposed corresponds to the power of the speaker who presents it, and we describe great and human men as worthy of speech, as though therein they had won the highest prize of excellence. And when speech is resolved into its several kinds, we find that, whereas poetry is more pleasing than profitable, and codes of law punish but do not instruct, and similarly. All the other kinds either contribute nothing to happiness, or else contain a harmful element mingled with the beneficial, while some of them actually pervert the truth, history alone. Since in it word and fact are in perfect agreement, embraces in its narration all the other qualities as well as that are useful, for it is ever to be seen urging men to justice, denouncing those who are evil, lauding the good, laying up in a word, for its readers a mighty store of experience. Consequently, we, observing that writers of history are accorded a merited approbation, were led to feel a like enthusiasm for the subject. But when we turned our attention to the historians before our time, although we approved their purpose without reservation, yet we were far from feeling that their treatises had been composed so as to contribute to human welfare as much as might have been the case. For although the profit which history affords its readers lies in its embracing a vast number and variety of circumstances, yet most writers have recorded no more than isolated wars waged by a single nation or a single state, and but few have undertaken, beginning with the earliest times and coming down to their own day, to record the events connected with all peoples, and of the latter, some have not attached to the several events their own proper dates, and others have passed over the deeds of barbarian peoples and some again have rejected the ancient legends because of the difficulties involved in their treatment, while others have failed to complete the plan to which they had set their hand, their lives having been cut short by fate. And of those who have undertaken this account of all peoples, not one has continued his history beyond the Macedonian period. For while some have closed their accounts with the deeds of Philip, others with those of Alexander, and some with the Diadochi or the Epigoni, yet... Despite the number and importance of the events subsequent to these and extending even to our own lifetime which have been left neglected, no historian has essayed to treat of them within the compass of a single narrative because of the magnitude of the undertaking. For this reason, since both the dates of the events and the events themselves lie scattered about in numerous treatises and in divers authors, the knowledge of them becomes difficult for the mind to encompass and for the memory to retain. Consequently, after we had examined the composition of each of these authors' works, we resolved to write a history after a plan which might yield to its readers the greatest benefit, and at the same time incommode them the least. For if a man should begin with the most ancient times and record to the best of his ability the affairs of the entire world down to his own day, so far as they have been handed down to memory, as though they were the affairs of some single city, he would obviously have to undertake an immense labor, yet he would have composed a treatise of the utmost value to those who are studiously inclined. For from such a treatise every man will be able readily to take what is of use for his special purpose, drawing as it were from a great fountain. The reason for this is that, in the first place, it is not easy for those who propose to go through the writings of so many historians to procure the books which come to be needed, and in the second place that, because the works vary so widely and are so numerous, the recovery of past events becomes extremely difficult of comprehension and of attainment, whereas, on the other hand, the treatise which keeps within the limits of a single narrative and contains a connected account of events facilitates the reading and contains such recovery of the past in a form that is perfectly easy to follow. In general, 
A history of this nature must be held to surpass all others to the same degree as the whole is more useful than the part in continuity than discontinuity. And, again, as an event whose date has been accurately determined is more useful than one of which it is not known in what period it happened. And so we, appreciating that an undertaking of this nature, while most useful, would yet require much labor and time, have been engaged upon it for thirty years. And with much hardship and many dangers we have visited a large portion of both Asia and Europe that we might see with our own eyes all the most important regions and as many others as possible. 4. Many errors have been committed through ignorance of the sites, not only by the common run of historians, but even by some of the highest reputation. As for the resources which have availed us in this undertaking, they have been, first and foremost, that enthusiasm for the work which enables every man to bring to completion the task which seems impossible, and, in the second place, the abundant supply which Rome affords of the materials pertaining to the proposed study, for the supremacy of this city, a supremacy so powerful that it extends to the bounds of the inhabited world, has provided us in the course of our long residence there with copious resources in the most accessible form. For since the city of our origin was Egerium in Sicily, and by reason of our contact with the Romans in that island we had gained a wide acquaintance with their language, we have acquired an accurate knowledge of all the events connected with this empire from the records which have been carefully preserved among them over a long period of time. Now we have begun our history with the legends of both Greeks and barbarians, after having first investigated to the best of our ability the accounts which each people records of its earliest times. Since my undertaking is now completed, although the volumes are as yet unpublished, I wish to present a brief preliminary outline of the work as a whole. Our first six books embrace the events and legends previous to the Trojan War, the first three setting forth the antiquities of the barbarians and the next three almost exclusively those of the Greeks. In the following eleven we have written a universal history of events from the Trojan War to the death of Alexander, and in the succeeding twenty-three books, we have given an orderly account of all subsequent events down to the beginning of the war between the Romans and the Celts, in the course of which the commander, Gaius Julius Caesar, who has been deified because of his deeds, subdued the most numerous and most warlike tribes of the Celts, and advanced the Roman Empire as far as the British Isles. The first events of this war occurred in the first year of the 180th Olympiad, when Herod's was Archon at Athens. As for the periods included in this work, we do not attempt to fix with any strictness the limits of those before the Trojan War, because no trustworthy chronological table covering them has come into our hands. But from the Trojan War we follow Apollodorus of Athens in setting the interval from then to the return of the Heraclidae as eighty years, from then to the first Olympiad three hundred and twenty-eight years, reckoning the dates by the reigns of the kings of Lacedaemon, and from the first Olympiad to the beginning of the Celtic War which we have made the end of our history, seven hundred and thirty years, so that our whole treatise of forty books embraces eleven hundred and thirty-eight years, exclusive of the periods which embrace the events before the Trojan War. We have given at the outset this precise outline, since we desire to inform our readers about the project as a whole, and at the same time to deter those who are accustomed to make their books by compilation, from mutilating works of which they are not the authors. And throughout our entire history it is to be hoped that what we have done well may not be the object of envy and that the matters wherein our knowledge is defective may receive correction at the hands of more able historians. Now that we have set forth the plan and purpose of our undertaking, we shall attempt to make good our promise of such a treatise. Concerning the various conceptions of the gods formed by those who were the first to introduce the worship of the deity, and concerning the myths which are told about each of the immortals. Although we shall refrain from setting forth the most part in detail, since such a procedure would require a long account. Yet whatever on these subjects we may feel to be pertinent to the several parts of our proposed history we shall present in a summary fashion, that nothing which is worth hearing may be found missing. Concerning, however, every race of men, and all events that have taken place in the known parts of the inhabited world, we shall give an accurate account. So far as that is possible in the case of things that happened so long ago, beginning with the earliest times, now, as regards the first origin of mankind, two opinions have arisen among the best authorities both on nature and on history. One group, which takes the position that the universe did not come into being and will not decay, 
has declared that the race of men also has existed from eternity. There having never been a time when men were first begotten, the other group, however, which hold that the universe came into being and will decay, has declared that, like it, men had their first origin at a definite time. When in the beginning, as their account runs, the universe was being formed, both heaven and earth were indistinguishable in appearance, since their elements were intermingled. Then, when their bodies separated from one another, the universe took on in all its parts the ordered form in which it is now seen, the air set up a continual motion, and the fiery element in it gathered into the highest regions, since anything of such a nature moves upward by reason of its lightness, and it is for this reason that the sun and the multitude of other stars became involved in the universal whirl, while all that was mud-like and thick and contained an admixture of moisture sank because of its weight into one place, and as this continually turned about upon itself, and became compressed, out of the wet it formed the sea, and out of what was firmer, the land, which was like potter's clay and entirely soft. But as the sun's fire shone upon the land, it first of all became firm, and then, since its surface was in a ferment because of the warmth, portions of the wet swelled up in masses in many places, and in these pustules covered with delicate membranes made their appearance. Such a phenomenon can be seen even yet in swamps and marshy places whenever, the ground having become cold, the air suddenly and without any gradual change becomes intensely warm. And while the wet was being impregnated with life by reason of the warmth in the manner described, by night the living things forthwith received their nourishment from the mist that fell from the enveloping air. And by day were made solid by the intense heat, and finally, when the embryos had attained their full development and the membranes had been thoroughly heated and broken open, there was produced every form of animal life. Of these, such as had partaken of the most warmth set off to the higher regions, having become winged, and such as retained an earthy consistency came to be numbered in the class of creeping things and of the other land animals, while those whose composition partook the most of the wet element gathered into the region congenial to them receiving the name of water animals. And since the earth constantly grew more solid through the action of the sun's fire and of the winds, it was finally no longer able to generate any of the larger animals. But each kind of living creatures was now begotten by breeding with one another. And apparently Euripides also, who was a pupil of Anaxagoras, the natural philosopher, is not opposed to this account of the nature of the universe. For in his Melanipe he writes as follows, Tis thus that the heaven and earth were once one form. But since the two were sundered each from each, they now beget and bring to life all things, the trees and birds, the beasts, the spawn of sea, and race of mortals. Concerning the first generation of the universe, this is the account which we have received. But the first men to be born, he says, led an undisciplined and bestial life, setting out one by one to secure their sustenance, and taking for their food both the tenderest herbs and the fruits of wild trees. Then, since they were attacked by the wild beasts, they came to each other's aid, being instructed by expediency, and when gathered together in this way by reason of their fear, they gradually came to recognize their mutual characteristics. And though the sounds which they made were at first unintelligible and indistinct, yet gradually they came to give articulation to their speech, and by agreeing with one another upon symbols for each thing which presented itself to them, made known among themselves the significance which was to be attached to each term. But since groups of this kind arose over every part of the inhabited world, not all men had the same language, inasmuch as every group organized the elements of its speech by mere chance. This is the explanation of the present existence of every conceivable kind of language. And furthermore, out of these first groups to be formed came all the original nations of the world. Now the first men, since none of the things useful for life had yet been discovered, led a wretched existence, having no clothing to cover them, knowing not the use of dwelling and fire, and also being totally ignorant of cultivated food. For since they also even neglected the harvesting of the wild food, they laid by no store of its fruits against their needs. Consequently, large numbers of them perished in the winters because of the cold and the lack of food. Little by little, however, experience taught them both to take to the caves in winter and to store such fruits as could be preserved. And when they had become acquainted with fire and other useful things, the arts also and whatever else is capable of furthering man's social life were gradually discovered. 
Indeed, speaking generally in all things, it was necessity itself that became man's teacher, supplying an appropriate fashion instruction in every matter to a creature which was well endowed by nature and had, as its assistance for every purpose, hands and speech and sagacity of mind. And as regards the first origin of men and their earliest manner of life, we shall be satisfied with what has been said, since we would keep due proportion in our account. But as regards all the events which have been handed down to memory and took place in the known regions of the inhabited world, we shall now undertake to give a full account of them. Now as to who were the first kings, we are in no position to speak on our own authority, nor do we give assent to those historians who profess to know, for it is impossible that the discovery of writing was of so early a date as to have been contemporary with the first kings. But if a man should concede even this last point, it still seems evident that writers of history are as a class a quite recent appearance in the life of mankind. Again, with respect to the antiquity of the human race, not only do Greeks put forth their claims, but many of the barbarians as well. All holding that it is they who were autochthonous, and the first of all men to discover the things which are of use in life, and that it was the events in their own history which were the earliest to have been held worthy of record. So far as we are concerned, however, we shall not make the attempt to determine with precision the antiquity of each nation, or what is the race whose nations are prior in point of time to the rest and by. How many years, but we shall record summarily, keeping due proportion in our account, what each nation has to say concerning its antiquity and the early events in its history. The first peoples which we shall discuss will be the barbarians, not that we consider them to be earlier than the Greeks, as Ephorus has said but because we wish to set forth most of the facts about them at the outset, in order that we may not, by beginning with the various accounts given by the Greeks, have to interpolate in the different narrations of their early history any event connected with another people. And since Egypt is the country where mythology places the origin of the gods, where the earliest observations of the stars are said to have been made, and where, furthermore, many noteworthy deeds of great men are recorded, we shall begin our history with the events connected with Egypt. Now the Egyptians have an account like this. When in the beginning the universe came into being, men first came into existence in Egypt, both because of the favorable climate of the land and because of the nature of the Nile. For this stream, since it produces much life and provides a spontaneous supply of food, easily supports whatever living things have been engendered, for both the root of the reed and the lotus as well as the Egyptian bean and corsayon, as it is called, and many other similar plants, supply the race of men with nourishment all ready for use. As proof that animal life appeared first of all in their land, they would offer the fact that even at the present day the soil of the Thebaid at certain times generates mice in such numbers and of such size as to astonish all who have witnessed the phenomenon, for some of them are fully formed as far as the breast and front feet and are able to move, while the rest of the body is unformed the clod of earth still retaining its natural character. And from this fact it is manifest that, when the world was first taking shape, the land of Egypt could better than any other have been the place where mankind came into being because of the well-tempered nature of its soil, for even at the present time. While the soil of no other country generates any such things, in it alone certain living creatures may be seen coming into being in a marvelous fashion. In general, he says that if in the flood which occurred in the time of Deucalion most living things were destroyed, it is probable that the inhabitants of southern Egypt survived rather than any others, since their country is rainless for the most part, or if, as some maintain, the destruction of living things was complete, and the earth then brought forth again new forms of animals, nevertheless. Even on such a supposition the first genesis of living things fittingly attaches to this country. For when the moisture from the abundant rains which fell among other peoples was mingled with the intense heat which prevails in Egypt itself, it is reasonable to suppose that the air became very well tempered for the first generation of all living things. Indeed, even in our day during the inundations of Egypt, the generation of forms of animal life can clearly be seen taking place in the pools which remain the longest. For, Whenever the river has begun to recede and the sun has thoroughly dried the surface of the slime, living animals, he says, take shape, some of them fully formed, but some only half so and still actually united with the very earth. Now the men of Egypt, he says, when ages ago they came into existence, as they looked up at the firmament and were struck with both awe and wonder at the nature of the universe, 
conceived that two gods were both eternal and first, namely, the sun and the moon, whom they called respectively Osiris and Isis, these appellations having in each case been based upon a certain meaning in them. For when the names are translated into Greek Osiris means many-eyed, and properly so, for in shedding his rays in every direction he surveys with many eyes, as it were, all land and sea. And the words of the poet are also in agreement with this conception when he says, The sun, who sees all things and hears all things. And of the ancient Greek writers of mythology some give to Osiris the name Dionysus, or, with a slight change in form, Sirius. One of them, Eumolpus in his Bacchic hymn, speaks of our Dionysus, shining like a star, with fiery eye in every ray, while Orpheus says, and this is why men call him Shining One, and Dionysus. Some say that Osiris is also represented with the cloak of fawn skin about his shoulders as imitating the sky spangled with the stars. As for Isis, when translated, the word means ancient, the name having been given her because her birth was from everlasting and ancient and they put horns on her head both because of the appearance which she has to the eye when the moon is crescent-shaped, and because among the Egyptians a cow is held sacred to her. These two gods, they hold, regulate the entire universe, giving both nourishment and increase to all things by means of a system of three seasons which complete the full cycle through an unobservable. Movement, these being spring and summer and winter, and these seasons, though in nature most opposed to one another, complete the cycle of the year in the fullest harmony. Moreover, practically all the physical matter which is essential to the generation of all things is furnished by these gods, the sun contributing the fiery element and the spirit, the moon the wet and the dry, and both together the air, and it is through these elements that all things are engendered and nourished. And so it is out of the sun and moon that the whole physical body of the universe is made complete. And as for the five parts just named of these bodies, the spirit, the fire, the dry, as well as the wet. And lastly, the air-like, just as in the case of a man we enumerate head and hands and feet and the other parts, so in the same way the body of the universe is composed in its entirety of these parts. Each of these parts they regard as a god, and to each of them the first men in Egypt to use articulate speech gave a distinct name appropriate to its nature. Now the spirit they called, as we translate their expression, Zeus, and since he was the source of the spirit of life in animals, they considered him to be in a sense the father of all things, and they say that the most renowned of the Greek poets also agrees with this when he speaks of this god as the father of men and of gods, the fire they called Hephaestus, as it is translated, holding him to be a great god and one who contributes much both to the birth and full development of all things. The earth, again, they looked upon as a kind of vessel which holds all growing things, and so gave it the name Mother. And in like manner the Greeks also call it Demeter, the word having been slightly changed in the course of time, for in olden times they called her G-meter, Earth Mother, to which Orpheus bears witness when he speaks of. Earth the mother of all, Demeter giver of wealth, and the wet, according to them, was called by the men of old ocean which, when translated, means fostering mother, though some of the Greeks have taken it to be Oceanus, in connection with whom the poet also speaks of, Oceanus' source of gods and mother Tethys. For the Egyptians consider Oceanus to be their river Nile, on which also their gods were born, since, they say, Egypt is the only country in the whole inhabited world where there are many cities which were founded by the first gods, such as Zeus, Helios, Hermes, Apollo, Pan, Ilithia, and many more. The air, they say, they called Athena, as the name is translated, and they considered her to be the daughter of Zeus and conceived of her as a virgin, because of fact that the air is by its nature uncorrupted and occupies the highest part of the entire universe. For the latter reason, also the myth arose that she was born from the head of Zeus. Another name given her was Tritogenia, thrice born, because her nature changes three times in the course of the year, in the spring, summer, and winter. They add that she is also called Glaucopus, blue-eyed, not because she has blue eyes, as some Greeks have held, a silly explanation indeed, but because the air has a bluish cast. These five deities, they say, visit all the inhabited world, revealing themselves to men in the form of sacred animals, and at times even appearing in the guise of men or in other shapes. Nor is this a fabulous thing. But possible, if these are in very truth the gods who give life to all things, 
and also the poet who visited Egypt and became acquainted with such accounts as these from the lips of the priests, in some place in his writings sets forth as actual fact what has been said. The gods, in strangers' form from alien lands, frequent the cities of men in Ivory guise, observing their insolence and lawful ways. Now so far as the celestial gods are concerned whose genesis is from eternity, this is the account given by the Egyptians. And besides these there are other gods, they say, who were terrestrial, having once been mortals, but who, by reason of their sagacity and the good services which they rendered to all men, attained immortality, some of them having even been kings in Egypt. Their names, when translated, are in some cases the same as those of the celestial gods, while others have a distinct appellation, such as Helios, Cronus, and Rhea, and also the Zeus who is called Ammon by some. And besides these Hera and Hephaestus, also Hestia, and finally, Hermes. Helios was the first king of the Egyptians, his name being the same as that of the heavenly star. Some of the priests, however, say that Hephaestus was their first king, since he was the discoverer of fire and received the rule because of this service to mankind. For once, when a tree on the mountains had been struck by lightning and the forest nearby was ablaze, Hephaestus went up to it, for it was winter time, and greatly enjoyed the heat. As the fire died down, he kept adding fuel to it, and while keeping the fire going in this way, he invited the rest of mankind to enjoy the advantage which came from it. Then Cronus became the ruler, and upon marrying his sister Rhea, he begat Osiris and Isis, according to some writers of mythology, but according to the majority, Zeus and Hera, whose high achievements gave them dominion over the entire universe. From these last were sprung five gods, one born on each of the five days which the Egyptians intercalate. The names of these children were Osiris and Isis, and also Typhon, Apollo, and Aphrodite, and Osiris when translated is Dionysus, and Isis is more similar to Demeter than to any other goddess. And after Osiris married Isis, and succeeded to the kingship, he did many things of service to the social life of man. Osiris was the first, they record, to make mankind give up cannibalism, for after Isis had discovered the fruit of both wheat and barley which grew wild over the land along with the other plants but was still unknown to man, and Osiris had also devised the cultivation of these fruits, all men were glad to change their food, both because of the pleasing nature of the newly discovered grains and because it seemed to their advantage to refrain from their butchery of one another. As proof of the discovery of these fruits, they offer the following ancient custom which they still observe. Even yet at harvest time, the people make a dedication of the first heads of the grain to be cut, and standing beside the sheaf, beat themselves and call upon Isis. By this act, rendering honor to the goddess for the fruits which she discovered, at the season when she first did this. Moreover, in some cities, during the festival of Isis as well, stalks of wheat and barley are carried among the other objects in the procession as a memorial of what the goddess so ingeniously discovered at the beginning. Isis also established laws, they say, in accordance with which the people regularly dispense justice to one another and are led to refrain through fear of punishment from illegal violence and insolence. And it is for this reason also that the early Greeks gave Demeter the name the Smophorus, acknowledging in this way that she had first established their laws. Osiris, they say, founded in the Egyptian the Bade, a city with a hundred gates, which the men of his day named after his mother, though later generations called it Diospolis, and some named it Thebes. There is no agreement, however, as to when this city was founded, not only among the historians, but even among the priests of Egypt themselves, for many writers say that Thebes was not founded by Osiris, but many years later by a certain king of whom we shall give a detailed account in connection with his period. Osiris, they add, also built a temple to his parents, Zeus and Hera, which was famous both for its size and its costliness in general, and two golden chapels to Zeus. The larger one to him is God of Heaven, the smaller one to him is former king and father of the Egyptians, in which Raal he is called by some Ammon. He also made golden chapels for the rest of the gods mentioned above, allotting honors to each of them and appointing priests to have charge over these. Special esteem at the court of Osiris and Isis was also accorded to those who should invent any of the arts or devise any useful process. Consequently, 
Since copper and gold mines had been discovered in the Thebaid, they fashioned implements with which they killed the wild beasts and worked the soil, and thus in eager rivalry brought the country under cultivation. And they made images of the gods and magnificent golden chapels for their worship. Osiris, they say, was also interested in agriculture and was reared in Nysa, a city of Arabia Felix near Egypt. Being a son of Zeus, and the name which he bears among the Greeks is derived both from his father and from the birthplace, since he is called Dionysus. Mention is also made of Nysa by the poet in his hymns, to the effect that it was in the vicinity of Egypt when he says, There is a certain Nysa, mountain high, with forests thick in Phoenic afar, close to Egyptus's streams. And the discovery of the vine, they say, was made by him near Nysa, and that having further devised the proper treatment of its fruit. He was the first to drink wine and taught mankind at large the culture of the vine and the use of wine, as well as the way to harvest the grape and to store wine. The one most highly honored by him was Hermes, who was endowed with unusual ingenuity for devising things capable of improving the social life of man. It was by Hermes, for instance, according to them, that the common language of mankind was first further articulated, and that many objects which were still nameless received an appellation, that the alphabet was invented and that ordinances regarding the honors and offerings due to the gods were duly established. He was the first also to observe the orderly arrangement of the stars and the harmony of the musical sounds and their nature, to establish a wrestling school, and to give thought to the rhythmical movement of the human body and its proper development. He also made a lyre and gave it three strings, imitating the seasons of the year, for he adopted three tones, a high, a low, and a medium, the high from the summer, the low from the winter, and the medium from the spring. The Greeks also were taught by him how to expound Hermenia, their thoughts, and it was for this reason that he was given the name Hermes. In a word, Osiris, taking him for his priestly scribe, communicated with him on every matter and used his counsel above that of all others. The olive tree also, they claim, was his discovery, not Athena's, as the Greeks say. Of Osiris, they say that, being of a beneficent turn of mind and eager for glory, he gathered together a great army. With the intention of visiting all the inhabited earth and teaching the race of men how to cultivate the vine and sow wheat and barley, for he supposed that if he made men give up their savagery and adopt a gentle manner of life, he would receive immortal honors because of the magnitude of his benefactions. And this did in fact take place since not only the men of his time who received his gift, but all succeeding generations as well, because of the delight which they take in the foods which were discovered. Have honored those who introduced them as gods most illustrious. Now after Osiris had established the affairs of Egypt and turned the supreme power over to Isis his wife, they say that he placed Hermes at her side as counselor because his prudence raised him above the king's other friends, and as general of all the land under his sway he left Heracles, who was both his kinsman and renowned for his valor and physical strength. While as governors he appointed Buziris over those parts of Egypt which lie towards Phoenicia and border upon the sea and Antaeus over those adjoining Ethiopia and Libya, then he himself left Egypt, with his army to make his campaign, taking in his company also his brother, whom the Greeks call Apollo. And it was Apollo, they say, who discovered the laurel, a garland of which all men place about the head of this god above all others. The discovery of ivy is also attributed to Osiris by the Egyptians and made sacred to this god, just as the Greeks also do in the case of Dionysus. And in the Egyptian language, they say, the ivy is called the plant of Osiris, and for purposes of dedication is preferred to the vine, since the latter sheds its leaves while the former ever remains green. The same rule, moreover, the ancients have followed in the case of other plants also which are perennially green, ascribing, for instance the myrtle to Aphrodite and the laurel to Apollo. Now Osiris was accompanied on his campaign, as the Egyptian account goes, by his two sons, Anubis and Macedon, who were distinguished for their valor. Both of them carried the most notable accoutrements of war, taken from certain animals whose character was not unlike the boldness of the men. Anubis wearing a dog's skin and Macedon the foreparts of a wolf, and it is for this reason that these animals are held in honor among the Egyptians. He also took Pan along on his campaign, who was held in special honor by the Egyptians, for the inhabitants of the land have not only set up statues of him at every temple, but have also named a city after him in the Thebaid, called by the natives Chemo, 
which when translated means city of Pan. In his company were also men who were experienced in agriculture, such as Maron in the cultivation of the vine, and Triptolemus in the sowing of grain, and in every step in the harvesting of it. And when all his preparations had been completed, Osiris made a vow to the gods that he would let his hair grow until his return to Egypt and then made his way through Ethiopia, and this is the reason why. This custom with regard to their hair was observed among the Egyptians until recent times, and why those who journeyed abroad let their hair grow until their return home. While he was in Ethiopia, their account continues, the satyr people were brought to him, who, they say, have hair upon their loins. For Osiris was laughter-loving and fond of music and the dance. Consequently, he took with him a multitude of musicians, among whom were nine maidens who could sing and were trained in the other arts. These maidens being those who among the Greeks are called the Muses, and their leader, Hedes, as the account goes, was Apollo, who was for that reason also given the name Musedes. As for the satyrs, they were taken along in the campaign because they were proficient in dancing and singing and every kind of relaxation and pastime, for Osiris was not warlike, nor did he have to organize pitched battles or engagements since every people received him as a god because of his benefactions. In Ethiopia he instructed the inhabitants in agriculture and founded some notable cities and then left behind him men to govern the country and collect the tribute. While Osiris and his army were thus employed, the Nile, they say, at the time of the rising of Sirius, which is the season when the river is usually at flood, breaking out of its banks inundated a large section of Egypt and covered especially that part where Prometheus was governor, and since practically everything in this district was destroyed. Prometheus was so grieved that he was on the point of quitting life willfully. Because its water sweeps down so swiftly and with such violence the river was given the name Addis, but Heracles being ever intent upon great enterprises and eager for the reputation of a manly spirit, speedily stopped the flood at its breach and turned the river back into its former course. Consequently, certain of the Greek poets worked the incident into a myth, to the effect that Heracles had killed the eagle which was devouring the liver of Prometheus. The river in the earliest period bore the name Ocean, which in Greek is Oceanus. Then, because of this flood, they say it was called Aetis, and still later it was known as Aegyptus after a former king of the land. And the poet also adds his testimony to this when he writes, On the river Aegyptus my curved ships I stayed, for it is a tonus, as it is called, which in early times was the trading port of Egypt that the river empties into the sea. Its last name and that which the river now bears it received from the former King Nilius. Now when Osiris arrived at the borders of Ethiopia, he curbed the river by dikes on both banks, so that at flood time it might not form stagnant pools over the land to its detriment, but that the flood water might be led upon the countryside in a gentle flow as it might be needed, through gates which he had built. After this he continued his march through Arabia along the shore of the Red Sea as far as India and the limits of the inhabited world. He also founded not a few cities in India, one of which he named Nisa, wishing to leave there a memorial of that city in Egypt where he had been reared. He also planted ivy in the Indian Nisa, and throughout India and those countries which border upon it the plant to this day is still to be found only in this region. And many other signs of his stay he left in that country which have led the Indians of a later time to lay claim to the god and say that he was by birth a native of India. Osiris also took an interest in hunting elephants, and everywhere left behind him inscribed pillars telling of his campaign. And he visited all the other nations of Asia as well and crossed into Europe at the Hellespont. In Thrace he slew Lycurgus, the king of the barbarians, who opposed his undertaking, and Maron, who was now old. He left there to supervise the culture of the plants which he introduced into that land, and caused him to found a city to bear his name which he called Maronea. Macedon his son, moreover, he left as king of Macedonia, which was named after him, while to Triptolemus he assigned the care of agriculture in Attica. Finally, Osiris in this way visited all the inhabited world and advanced community life by the introduction of the fruits which are most easily cultivated. And if any country did not admit of the growing of vine, he introduced the drink prepared from barley, which is little inferior to wine in aroma and strength. On his return to Egypt he brought with him the very greatest presents from every quarter, and by reason of the magnitude of his benefactions received the gift of immortality with the approval of all men, 
and honor equal to that offered to the gods of heaven. After this he passed from the midst of men into the company of the gods, and received from Isis and Hermes sacrifices and every other highest honor. These also instituted rites for him, and introduced many things of a mystic nature, magnifying in this way the power of the god. Although the priests of Osiris had from the earliest times received the account of his death as a matter not to be divulged. In the course of years it came about that through some of their number this hidden knowledge was published to the many. This is the story as they give it. When Osiris was ruling over Egypt as its lawful king, he was murdered by his brother Typhon, a violent and impious man. Typhon then divided the body of the slain man into twenty-six pieces and gave one portion to each of the band of murderers, since he wanted all of them to share in the pollution and felt that in this way he would have in them steadfast supporters and defenders of his rule. But Isis, the sister and wife of Osiris, avenged his murder with the aid of her son Horus, and after slaying Typhon and his accomplices became queen over Egypt. The struggle between them took place on the banks of the Nile near the village now known as Antaeus, which, they say, lies on the Arabian side of the river and derives its name from that Ofo Antaeus, a contemporary of Osiris, who was punished by Heracles. Now Isis recovered all the pieces of the body except the privates, and wishing that the burial place of her husband should remain secret and yet be honored by all the inhabitants of Egypt, she fulfilled her purpose in somewhat the following manner. Over each piece of the body, as the account goes, she fashioned out of spices and wax a human figure about the size of Osiris, then summoning the priests group by group. She required all of them an oath that they would reveal to no one the trust which she was going to confide to them. And taking each group of them apart privately, she said that she was consigning to them alone the burial of the body. And after reminding them of the benefactions of Osiris, she exhorted them to bury his body in their own district and pay honors to him as to a god and to consecrate to him also someone that they might choose of the animals native to their district, pay it while living the honors which they had formerly rendered to Osiris, and upon its death accord it the same kind of funeral as they had given to him. And since Isis wished to induce the priests to render these honors by the incentive of their own prophet also, she gave them the third part of the country to defray the cost of the worship and service of the gods. And the priests, it is said, being mindful of the benefactions of Osiris and eager to please the queen who was petitioning them, and incited as well by their own prophet, did everything just as Isis had suggested. It is for this reason that even to this day each group of priests supposes that Osiris lies buried in their district, pays honors to the animals which were originally consecrated to him, and, when these die, renews in the funeral rites for them the mourning for Osiris. The consecration to Osiris, however, of the sacred bulls, which are given the names Apis and Enevis, and worship of them as gods were introduced generally among all the Egyptians, since these animals had, more than any others, rendered aid to those who discovered the fruit of the grain, in connection with both the sowing of the seed and with every agricultural labor from which mankind profits. Isis, they say, after the death of Osiris, took a vow never to marry another man and passed the remainder of her life reigning over the land with complete respect for the law and surpassing all sovereigns in benefactions to her subjects. And like her husband she also, when she passed from among men, received immortal honors and was buried near Memphis, where her shrine is pointed out to this day in the temple area of Hephaestus. According to some writers, however, the bodies of these two gods rest not in Memphis but on the border between Egypt and Ethiopia, on the island in the Nile which lies near the city which is called Philae, but is referred to because of this burial as the Holy Field. In proof of this, they point to remains which still survive on this island, both to the tomb constructed for Osiris, which is honored in common by all the priests of Egypt, and to the 360 libation bowls which are placed around it, for the priests appointed over these bowls fill them each day with milk, singing all the while a dirge in which they call upon the names of these gods. It is for this reason that travelers are not allowed to set foot on this island, and all the inhabitants of the Thebaid, which is the oldest portion of Egypt, hold it to be the strongest oath when a man swears by Osiris who lieth in Philae. Now the parts of the body of Osiris which were found were honored with burial, they say, in the manner described above, but the privates, according to them, were thrown by Typhon into the Nile because no one of his accomplices was willing to take them. Yet Isis thought them as worthy of divine honors as the other parts, 
for, fashioning a likeness of them, she set it up in the temples, commanded that it be honored, and made it the object of the highest regard and reverence in the rites and sacrifices accorded to the god. Consequently the Greeks too, inasmuch as they received from Egypt the celebrations of the orgies and the festivals connected with Dionysus. Honor this member in both the mysteries and the initiatory rites and sacrifices of this god, giving it the name Phallus. The number of years from Osiris and Isis, they say, to the reign of Alexander who founded the city which bears his name in Egypt, is over 10,000, but, according to other writers, a little less than 23,000. And those who say that the god was born of Semel and Zeus in Boeotian Thebes are, according to the priests, simply inventing the tale. For they say that Orpheus, upon visiting Egypt and participating in the initiation and mysteries of Dionysus, adopted them, and as a favor to the descendants of Cadmus, since he was kindly disposed to them and received honors at their hands, transferred the birth of the god to Thebes and the common people, partly out of ignorance and partly out of their desire to have the god thought to be a Greek, eagerly accepted his initiatory rites and mysteries. What led Orpheus to transfer the birth and rights of the god, they say, was something like this. Cadmus, who was a citizen of Egyptian Thebes, begat several children, of whom one was Semel. She was violated by an unknown person, became pregnant, and after seven months gave birth to a child whose appearance was such as the Egyptians hold had been that of Osiris. Now such a child is not usually brought into the world alive, either because it is contrary to the will of the gods, or because the law of nature does not admit of it. But when Cadmus found out what had taken place, having at the same time a reply from an oracle commanding him to observe the laws of his fathers, he both gilded the infant and paid it the appropriate sacrifices, on the ground that there had been a sort of epiphany of Osiris among men. The fatherhood of the child he attributed to Zeus, in this way magnifying Osiris and averting slander from his violated daughter, and this is the reason why the tale was given out among the Greeks to the effect that Semel, the daughter of Cadmus, was the mother of Osiris by Zeus. Now at a later time Orpheus, who was held in high regard among the Greeks for his singing, initiatory rites, and instructions on things divine, was entertained as a guest by the descendants of Cadmus, and accorded unusual honors in Thebes. And since he had become conversant with the teachings of the Egyptians about the gods, he transferred the birth of the ancient Osiris to more recent times, and, out of regard for the descendants of Cadmus, instituted a new initiation, in the ritual of which the initiates were given the account that Dionysus had been born of Semel and Zeus. And the people observed these initiatory rites partly because they were deceived through their ignorance, partly because they were attracted to them by the trustworthiness of Orpheus and his reputation in such matters, and most of all because they were glad to receive the god as a Greek, which, as has been said, is what he was considered to be. Later, after the writers of myths and poets had taken over this account of his ancestry, the theaters became filled with it, and among following generations faith in the story grew stubborn and immutable. In general, they say, the Greeks appropriate to themselves the most renowned of both Egyptian heroes and gods, and so also the colonies sent out by them. Heracles, for instance, was by birth an Egyptian, who by virtue of his manly vigor visited a large part of the inhabited world and set up his pillar in Libya and their proofs of this assertion they endeavor to draw from the Greeks themselves. For inasmuch as it is generally accepted that Heracles fought on the side of the Olympian gods in their war against the giants, they say that it in no way accords with the age of the earth for the giants to have been born in the period when, as the Greeks, Heracles lived, which was a generation before the Trojan War. But rather at the time, as their own account gives it, when mankind first appeared on the earth, for from the latter time to the present the Egyptians reckon more than ten thousand years, but from the Trojan War less than twelve hundred. Likewise, both the club and the lion's skin are appropriate to their ancient Heracles, because in those days arms had not yet been invented, and men defended themselves against their enemies with clubs of wood and used the hides of animals for defensive armor. They also designate him as the son of Zeus, but about the identity of his mother they say that they know nothing the son of Alcman, who was born more than ten thousand years later and was called Alcaeus at birth, in later life became known instead as Heracles, not because he gained glory, Cleos, by the aid of Hera, as Matris says, but because, having avowed the same principles as the ancient Heracles, 
he inherited that one's fame and name as well. The account of the Egyptians agrees also with the tradition which has been handed down among the Greeks since very early times, to the effect that Heracles cleared the earth of wild beasts, a story which is in no way suitable for man who lived in approximately the period of the Trojan War, when most parts of the inhabited world had already been reclaimed from their wild state by agriculture and cities, and the multitude of men settled everywhere over the land. Accordingly, this reclamation of the land suits better a man who lived in early times, when men were still held in subjection by the vast numbers of wild beasts. A state of affairs which was especially true in the case of Egypt, the upper part of which is to this day desert and infested with wild beasts. Indeed, it is reasonable to suppose that the first concern of Heracles was for this country as his birthplace, and that after he had cleared the land of wild beasts, he presented it to the peasants and for this benefaction was accorded divine honors. And they say that Perseus also was born in Egypt, and that the origin of Isis is transferred by the Greeks to Argos in the myth which tells of that Io who was changed into a heifer. In general there is great disagreement over these gods, for the same goddess is called by some Isis, by others Demeter, by others the Smophorus, by others Selen, by others Hera, while still others apply to her all these names. Osiris has been given the name Serapis by some, Dionysus by others, Pluto by others, Ammon by others, Zeus by some. And many have considered Pan to be the same god, and some say that Serapis is the god whom the Greeks call Pluto. As for Isis, the Egyptians say that she was the discoverer of many health-giving drugs and was greatly versed in the science of healing. Consequently, now that she has attained immortality, she finds her greatest delight in the healing of mankind and gives aid in their sleep to those who call upon her, plainly manifesting both her very presence and her beneficence towards men who ask her help. In proof of this, as they say, they advance not legends as the Greeks do, but manifest facts, for practically the entire inhabited world is their witness, in that it eagerly contributes to the honors of Isis because she manifests herself in healings. For standing above the sick in their sleep, she gives them aid for their diseases and works remarkable cures upon such as submit themselves to her, and many who have been despaired of by their physicians because of the difficult nature of their malady are restored to health by her, while numbers who have altogether lost the use of their eyes or of some other part of their body, whenever they turn for help to this goddess, are restored to their previous condition. Furthermore, she discovered also the drug which gives immortality by means of which she not only raised from the dead her son Horus, who had been the object of plots on the part of Titans and had been found dead under the water, giving him his soul again, but also made him immortal. And it appears that Horus was the last of the gods to be king after his father Osiris departed from among men. Moreover, they say that the name Horus, when translated, is Apollo, and that, having been instructed by his mother Isis in both medicine and divination, he is now a benefactor of the race of men through his oracular responses and his healings. The priests of the Egyptians, reckoning the time from the reign of Helios to the crossing of Alexander into Asia, say that it was in round numbers 23,000 years. And, as their legends say, the most ancient of the gods ruled more than 1,200 years and the later ones not less than 300. But since this great number of years surpasses belief, some men would maintain that in early times, before the movement of the sun had as yet been recognized, it was customary to reckon the year by the lunar cycle. Consequently, since the year consisted of thirty days, it was not impossible that some men lived twelve hundred years, for in our own time, when our year consists of twelve months, not a few men live over one hundred years. A similar explanation they also give regarding those who are supposed to have reigned for three hundred years, for at their time, namely, the year was composed of the four months which comprise the seasons of each year, that is, spring, summer, and winter, and it is for this reason that among some of the Greeks the years are called seasons, horoi, and that their yearly records are given the name horographs. Furthermore, the Egyptians relate in their myths that in the time of Isis there were certain creatures of many bodies, who are called by the Greeks giants, but by themselves. These being the men who are represented on their temples in monstrous form and as being cudgeled by Osiris. Now some say that they were born of the earth at the time when the genesis of living things from the earth was still recent, while some hold that they were only men of unusual physical strength who achieved many deeds and for this reason were described in the myths as of many bodies. 
but it is generally agreed that when they stirred up war against Zeus and Osiris, they were all destroyed. The Egyptians also made a law, they say, contrary to the general custom of mankind, permitting men to marry their sisters. This being due to the success attained by Isis in this respect, for she had married her brother Osiris, and upon his death, having taken a vow never to marry another man. She both avenged the murder of her husband and reigned all her days over the land with complete respect for the laws, and, in a word, became the cause of more and greater blessings to all men than any other. It is for these reasons, in fact, that it was ordained that the queen should have greater power and honor than the king, and that among private persons the wife should enjoy authority over her husband. The husbands agreeing in the marriage contract that they will be obedient in all things to their wives. Now I am not unaware that some historians give the following account of Isis and Osiris. The tombs of these gods lie in Nysa in Arabia, and for this reason Dionysus is also called Nisaius. And in that place there stands also a stale of each of the gods bearing an inscription in hieroglyphs. On the stale of Isis it runs, I am Isis, the queen of every land, she who was instructed of Hermes, and whatsoever laws I have established, these can no man make void. I am the eldest daughter of the youngest god Cronus. I am the wife and sister of the king Osiris. I am she who first discovered fruits for mankind. I am the mother of Horus the king. I am she who riseth in the star that is in the constellation of the dog. By me was the city of Bubastus built. Farewell, farewell, O Egypt, that nurtured me. And on the stale of Osiris the inscription is said to run. My father is Cronus, the youngest of all the gods, and I am Osiris the king who campaigned over every country as far as the uninhabited regions of India and the lands to the north, even to the sources of the river Ister, and again to the remaining parts of the world as far as Oceanus. I am the eldest son of Cronus, and being sprung from a fair and noble egg, I was begotten a seed of kindred birth today. There is no region of the inhabited world to which I have not come, dispensing to all men the things of which I was the discoverer. So much of the inscriptions on the stele can be read, they say, but the rest of the writing, which was of greater extent, has been destroyed by time. However this may be, varying accounts of the burial of these gods are found in most writers by reason of the fact that the priests, having received the exact facts about these matters as a secret not to be divulged, are unwilling to give out the truth to the public, on the ground that perils overhang any men who disclose to the common crowd the secret knowledge about these gods. Now, the Egyptians say that, also after these events, a great number of colonies were spread from Egypt over all the inhabited world. To Babylon, for instance, colonists were led by Bilus, who was held to be the son of Poseidon and Libya, and after establishing himself on the Euphrates River, he appointed priests, called Chaldeans by the Babylonians, who were exempt from taxation and free from every kind of service to the state, as are the priests of Egypt, and they also make observations of the stars. Following the example of the Egyptian priests, physicists, and astrologers. They say also that those who set forth with Danaus, likewise from Egypt, settled what is practically the oldest city in Greece, Argos, and that the nation of the Colchi and Pontus and that of the Jews, which lies between Arabia and Syria, were founded as colonies by certain emigrants from their country. And this is the reason why it is a long established institution among these two peoples to circumcise their male children the custom having been brought over from Egypt. Even the Athenians, they say, are colonists from SAS in Egypt, and they undertake to offer proofs of such a relationship, for the Athenians are the only Greeks who call their city Asti, a name brought over from the city Asti in Egypt. Furthermore, their body politic had the same classification and division of the people as found in Egypt, where the citizens have been divided into three orders, the first Athenian class consisted of the Eupatrids, as they were called, being those who were such as had received the best education and were held worthy of the highest honor, as is the case with the priests of Egypt. The second was that of the Geomeroi, who were expected to possess arms and to serve in defense of the state, like those in Egypt who are known as husbandmen and supply the warriors. And the last class was reckoned to be that of the Demiurgoi who practice the mechanical arts and render only the most menial services to the state, this class among the Egyptians having a similar function. Moreover, certain of the rulers of Athens were originally Egyptians, they say. Petes, for instance, 
the father of that Menestius who took part in the expedition against Troy, having clearly been an Egyptian, later obtained citizenship at Athens and the kingship. He was of double form, and yet the Athenians are unable from their own point of view to give the true explanation of this nature of his, although it is patent to all that it was because of his double citizenship. Greek and barbarian that he was held to be of double form, that is, part animal and part man. In the same way they continue, Erechtheus also, who was by birth an Egyptian, became king of Athens, and in proof of this they offer the following considerations. Once, when there was a great drought, as is generally agreed, which extended over practically all the inhabited earth except Egypt because of the peculiar character of that country, and there followed a destruction both of crops and of men in great numbers, Erechtheus, through his racial connection with Egypt, brought from there to Athens a great supply of grain and in return those who had enjoyed this aid made their benefactor king. After he had secured the throne, he instituted the initiatory rites of Demeter in Eleusis and established the mysteries, transferring their ritual from Egypt. And the tradition that an advent of the goddess into Attica also took place at that time is reasonable, since it was then that the fruits which are named after her were brought to Athens. And this is why it was thought that the discovery of the seed had been made again, as though Demeter had bestowed the gift and the Athenians on their part agree that it was in the reign of Erechtheus, when a lack of rain had wiped out the crops, that Demeter came to them with the gift of grain. Furthermore, the initiatory rites and mysteries of this goddess were instituted at Eleusis at that time, and their sacrifices as well as their ancient ceremonies are observed by the Athenians in the same way as by the Egyptians, for the Eumopidae were derived from the priests of Egypt and the Ceresis from the Pastophoroi. They are also the only Greeks who swear by Isis, and they closely resemble the Egyptians in both their appearance and manners. By many other statements like these, spoken more out of a love for glory than with regard for the truth, as I see the matter, they claim Athens as a colony of theirs because of the fame of that city. In general, the Egyptians say that their ancestors sent forth numerous colonies to many parts of the inhabited world. The preeminence of their former kings and their excessive population but since they offer no precise proof whatsoever for these statements, and since no historian worthy of credence testifies in their support, we have not thought that their accounts merited recording. So far as the ideas of the Egyptians about the gods are concerned, let what we have said suffice, since we are aiming at due proportion in our account, but with regard to the land, the Nile, and everything else worth hearing about we shall endeavor in each case to give the several facts in summary. The land of Egypt stretches in a general way from north to south, and in natural strength and beauty of landscape is reputed to excel in no small degree all other regions that have been formed into kingdoms. For on the west it is fortified by the desert of Libya, which is full of wild beasts and extends along its border for a long distance, and by reason of its lack of rain and want of every kind of food makes the passage through it not only toilsome, but even highly dangerous while on the south the same protection is afforded by the cataracts of the Nile and the mountains flanking them, since from the country of the Trogodites and the farthest parts of Ethiopia, over a distance of 5,500 stades, it is not easy to sail by the river or to journey by land, unless a man is fitted out like a king, or at least on a very great scale. And as for the parts of the country facing the east, some are fortified by the river, and some are embraced by a desert and a swampy flat called the Barathra. For between Koel Syria and Egypt there lies a lake, quite narrow but marvelously deep and some two hundred stades in length, which is called Serbonus, and offers unexpected perils to those who approach it in ignorance of its nature. For since the body of the water is narrow like a ribbon, and surrounded on all sides by great dunes, when there are constant south winds great quantities of sand are strewn over it. This sand hides the surface of the water and makes the outline of the lake continuous with the solid land and entirely indistinguishable from it. For this reason, many who were unacquainted with the peculiar nature of the place have disappeared together with whole armies when they wandered from the beaten road. For as the sand is walked upon it gives way but gradually, deceiving with a kind of malevolent cunning those who advance upon it, until, suspecting some impending mishap. They begin to help one another only when it is no longer possible to turn back or escape. For anyone who has been sucked in by the mire cannot swim, since the slime prevents all movement of the body, nor is he able to wade out. 
since he has no solid footing, for by reason of the mixing of the sand with the water and the consequent change in the nature of both, it comes about that the place cannot be crossed either on foot or by boat. Consequently, those who enter upon these regions are borne towards the depths and have nothing to grasp to give them help, since the sand along the edge slips in with them. These flats have received a name appropriate to their nature as we have described it, being called Barathra. Now that we have set forth the facts about the three regions which fortify Egypt by land, we shall add to them the one yet remaining, the fourth side, which is washed over its whole extent by waters which are practically harborless, has for a defense before it the Egyptian sea. The voyage along the coast of this sea is exceedingly long, and any landing is especially difficult, for from Paratonium in Libya as far as Iop in Coel Syria, a voyage along the coast of some five thousand stades, there is not to be found a safe harbor except Pharaoh's. And apart from these considerations, a sandbank extends along practically the whole length of Egypt, not discernible to any who approach without previous experience of these waters. Consequently, those who think that they have escaped the peril of the sea, and in their ignorance turn with gladness towards the shore, suffer unexpected shipwreck when their vessels suddenly run aground, and now and then mariners who cannot see land in time because the country lies so low are cast ashore before they realize it, some of them on marshy and swampy places and others on a desert region. The land of Egypt then is fortified on all sides by nature in the manner described, and is oblong in shape, having a coastline of two thousand stades and extending inland about six thousand stades. In density of population it far surpassed of old all known regions of the inhabited world and even in our own day is thought to be second to none other, for in ancient times it had over eighteen thousand important villages and cities, as can be seen entered in their sacred records. While under Ptolemy son of Lagus these were reckoned at over thirty thousand, this great number continuing down to our own time. The total population, they say, was of old about seven million, and the number has remained no less down to our day. It is for this reason that according to our historical accounts, the ancient kings Egypt built great and marvelous works with the aid of so many hands and left in them immortal monuments to their glory. But these matters we shall set forth in detail a little later. Now we shall tell of the nature of the river and the distinctive features of the country. The Nile flows from south to north, having its sources in regions which have never been seen. Since they lie in the desert at the extremity of Ethiopia in a country that cannot be approached because of the excessive heat, being as it is the largest of all rivers as well as the one which traverses the greatest territory, it forms great windings, now turning towards the east and Arabia, now turning towards the west and Libya, for its course from the mountains of Ethiopia to where it empties into the sea is a distance inclusive of its windings, of some twelve thousand stades. In its lower stretches it is more and more reduced in volume as the flow is drawn off to the two continents. Of the streams which thus break off from it, those which turn off into Libya are swallowed up by the sand, which lies there to an incredible depth, while those which pour in the opposite direction into Arabia are diverted into immense fens and large marshes on whose shores dwell many peoples. But where it enters Egypt it has a width of ten stades, sometimes less, and flows, not in a straight course, but in windings of every sort, for it twists now towards the east, now towards the west, and at times even towards the south, turning entirely back upon itself. For sharp hills extend along both sides of the river, which occupy much of the land bordering upon it and are cut through by precipitous ravines, in which are narrow defiles. And when it comes to these hills, the stream rushes rapidly backward through the level country. And after being borne southward over an area of considerable extent resumes once more its natural course. Distinguished as it is in these respects above all other streams, the Nile is also the only river which makes its way without violence or on rushing waves, except at the cataracts, as they are called. This is a place which is only about ten stades in length, but has a steep descent and is shut in by precipices so as to form a narrow cleft, rugged in its entire length and ravine-like, full, moreover, of huge boulders which stand out of the water like peaks. And since the river is split about these boulders with great force, and is often turned back so that it rushes in the opposite direction because of the obstacles, remarkable whirlpools are formed. The middle space, moreover, for its entire length is filled with foam made by the backward rush of the water, and strikes those who approach it with great terror.
And in fact, the descent of the river is so swift and violent that it appears to the eye like the very rush of an arrow. During the flood time of the Nile, when the peaked rocks are covered and the entire rapids are hidden by the large volume of the water, some men descend the cataract when they find the winds against them. But no man can make his way up it, since the force of the river overcomes every human device. Now there are still other cataracts of this nature, but the largest is the one on the border between Ethiopia and Egypt. The Nile also embraces islands within its waters, of which there are many in Ethiopia and one of considerable extent called Mero, on which there also lies a famous city bearing the same name as the island, which was founded by Cambyses and named by him after his mother Mero. This island, they say, has the shape of a long shield and in size far surpasses the other islands in these parts, for they state that it is three thousand stades long and a thousand wide. It also contains not a few cities, the most famous of which is Miro, extending the entire length of the island where it is washed by the river there are, on the side towards Libya, the dunes containing an infinite amount of sand, and on the side towards Arabia, rugged cliffs. There are also to be found in it mines of gold, silver, iron, and copper, and it contains in addition much ebony and every kind of precious stone. Speaking generally, the river forms so many islands that the report of them can scarcely be credited, for, apart from the regions surrounded by water in what is called the Delta, there are more than 700 other islands, of which some are irrigated by the Ethiopians and planted with millet though others are so overrun by snakes and dog-faced baboons and other animals of every kind that human beings cannot set foot upon them. Now, where the Nile in its course through Egypt divides into several streams, it forms the region which is called from its shape the delta. The two sides of the delta are described by the outermost branches, while its base is formed by the sea which receives the discharge from the several outlets of the river. It empties into the sea in seven mouths, of which the first, beginning at the east, is called the Pelusiac, the second the Tanitic, then the Mendesian, Fatnitic, and Sebenitic, then the Bulbatine, and finally the Canopic, which is called by some the Heracleotic. There are also other mouths built by the hand of man, about which there is no special need to write. At each mouth is a walled city, which is divided into two parts by the river and provided on each side of the mouth with pontoon bridges and guardhouses at suitable points. From the Pelusiac mouth, there is an artificial canal to the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea. The first to undertake the construction of this was Necho, the son of Semeticus. And after him, Darius the Persian made progress with the work for a time, but finally left it unfinished, for he was informed by certain persons that if he dug through the neck of land, he would be responsible for the submergence of Egypt, for they pointed out to him that the Red Sea was higher than Egypt. At a later time, the second Ptolemy completed it, and in the most suitable spot constructed an ingenious kind of a lock. This he opened, whenever he wished to pass through, and quickly closed again, a contrivance which usage proved to be highly successful. The river which flows through this canal is named Ptolemy, after the builder of it, and has at its mouth the city called Arsino. The delta is much like Sicily in shape, and its sides are each 750 stades long and its base, where it is washed by the sea, 1,300 stades. This island is intersected by many artificial canals and includes the fairest land in Egypt. For since it is alluvial soil and well watered, it produces many crops of every kind, inasmuch as the river by its annual rise regularly deposits on it fresh slime. And the inhabitants easily irrigate its whole area by means of a contrivance which was invented by Archimedes of Syracuse and is called, after its shape, a screw. Since the Nile has a gentle current, carries down a great quantity of all kinds of earth, and furthermore gathers in stagnant pools in low places, marshes are formed which abound in every kind of plant. For tubers of every flavor grow in them and fruits and vegetables which grow on stalks of a nature peculiar to the country, supplying an abundance sufficient to render the poor and the sick among the inhabitants self-sustaining. For not only do they afford a varied diet, ready at hand and abundant for all who need it, but they also furnish not a few of the other things which contribute to the necessities of life. The lotus, for instance, grows in great profusion, and from it the Egyptians make a bread which is able to satisfy the physical needs of the body, and the cyborium, which is found in great abundance, bears what is called the Egyptian bean. 
There are also many kinds of trees of which that called Percy, which was introduced from Ethiopia by the Persians when Cambyses conquered those regions, has an unusually sweet fruit. While of the fig mulberry trees, one kind bears the black mulberry and another a fruit resembling the fig and since the latter produces throughout almost the whole year. The result is that the poor have a ready source to turn to in their need. The fruit called the blackberry is picked at the time the river is receding, and by reason of its natural sweetness is eaten as a dessert. The Egyptians also make a drink out of barley which they call zythos, the bouquet of which is not much inferior to that of wine. Into their lamps they pour for lighting purposes, not the oil of the olive but a kind which is extracted from a plant and called kiki. Many other plants capable of supplying men with the necessities of life grow in Egypt in great abundance, but it would be a long task to tell about them. As for animals, the Nile breeds many of peculiar form, and two which surpass the others, the crocodile and what is called the horse. Of these animals, the crocodile grows to be the largest from the smallest beginning, since this animal lays eggs about the size of those of a goose but after the young is hatched it grows to be as long as sixteen cubits. It is as long-lived as man, and has no tongue. The body of the animal is wondrously protected by nature, for its skin is covered all over with scales and is remarkably hard, and there are many teeth in both jaws, two being tusks, much larger than the rest. It devours the flesh not only of men but also of any land animal which approaches the river. The bites which it makes are huge and severe, and it lacerates terribly with its claws, and whatever part of the flesh it tears it renders altogether difficult to heal. In early times the Egyptians used to catch these beasts with hooks baited with the flesh of pigs, but since then they have hunted them sometimes with heavy nets, as they catch some kinds of fish, and sometimes from their boats with iron spears which they strike repeatedly into the head. The multitude of them in the river and the adjacent marshes is beyond telling since they are prolific and are seldom slain by the inhabitants, for it is the custom of most of the natives of Egypt to worship the crocodile as a god, while for foreigners there is no profit whatsoever in the hunting of them since their flesh is not edible. But against this multitude's increasing and menacing the inhabitants' nature has devised a great help, for the animal called the ecnumon, which is about the size of a small dog, goes about breaking the eggs of the crocodiles, since the animal lays them on the banks of the river, and what is most astonishing of all. Without eating them or profiting in any way, it continually performs a service, which, in a sense, has been prescribed by nature and forced upon the animal for the benefit of men. The animal called the horse is not less than five cubits high, and is four-footed and cloven-hoofed like the ox. It has tusks larger than those of the wild boar, three on each side, and ears and tail and a cry somewhat like those of the horse but the trunk of its body as a whole is not unlike that of the elephant, and its skin is the toughest of almost any beasts. Being a river and land animal, it spends the day in the streams exercising in the deep water, while at night it forages about the countryside on the grain and hay so that, if this animal were prolific and reproduced each year, it would entirely destroy the farms of Egypt. But even it is caught by the united work of many men who strike it with iron spears, for whenever it appears they converge their boats upon it, and gathering about it wound it repeatedly with a kind of chisel fitted with iron barbs, and then fastening the end of a rope of tow to one of them which has become embedded in the animal. They let it go until it dies from loss of blood. Its meat is tough and hard to digest, and none of its inward parts is edible, neither the viscera nor the intestines. Beside the beasts above mentioned the Nile contains every variety of fish, and in numbers beyond belief, for it supplies the natives not only with abundant subsistence from the fish freshly caught, but it also yields an unfailing multitude for salting. Speaking generally, we may say that the Nile surpasses all the rivers of the inhabited world in its benefactions to mankind. For, beginning to rise at the summer solstice, it increases in volume until the autumnal equinox, and since it is bringing down fresh mud all the time, it soaks both the fallow land and the seed land as well as the orchard land for so long a time as the farmers may wish. For since the water comes with a gentle flow, they easily divert the river from their fields by small dams of earth, and then, by cutting these, as easily let the river in again upon the land whenever they think this to be advantageous. 
and in general the Nile contributes so greatly to the lightening of labor as well as to the profit of the inhabitants that the majority of the farmers, as they begin work upon the areas of the land which are becoming dry, merely scatter their seed, turn their herds and flocks in on the fields. And after they have used these for trampling the seed in return after four or five months to harvest it, while some, applying light plows to the land, turn over no more than the surface of the soil after its wetting and then gather great heaps of grain without much expense or exertion. For, generally speaking, every kind of field labor among other peoples entails great expense and toil, but among the Egyptians alone is the harvest gathered in with very slight outlay of money and labor. Also the land planted with the vine, being irrigated as are the other fields, yields an abundant supply of wine to the natives. And those who allow the land after it has been inundated, to lie uncultivated and give it over to the flocks to graze upon, are rewarded with flocks which, because of the rich pasturage, lamb twice and are twice shorn every year. The rise of the Nile is a phenomenon which appears wonderful enough to those who have witnessed it, but to those who have only heard of it, quite incredible. For while all other rivers begin to fall at the summer solstice and grow steadily lower and lower during the course of the following summer, this one alone begins to rise at that time and increases so greatly in volume day by day that it finally overflows practically all Egypt. And in like manner it afterwards follows precisely the opposite course and for an equal length of time gradually falls each day until it has returned to its former level. And since the land is a level plain, while the cities and villages, as well as the farmhouses, lie on artificial mounds, the scene comes to resemble the Cyclades Islands. The wild land animals for the larger part are cut off by the river and perish in its waters, but a few escape by fleeing to higher ground. The herds and flocks, however, are maintained at the time of the flood in the villages and farmhouses, where fodder is stored up for them in advance. The masses of the people, being relieved of their labors during the entire time of the inundation, turn to recreation, feasting all the whole and enjoying without hindrance every device of pleasure. And because of the anxiety occasioned by the rise of the river, the kings have constructed a nilometer at Memphis, where those who are charged with the administration of it accurately measure the rise and dispatch messages to the cities, and inform them exactly how many cubits or fingers the river has risen and when it has commenced to fall. In this manner the entire nation, when it has learned that the river has ceased rising and begun to fall, is relieved of its anxiety while at the same time all immediately know in advance how large the next harvest will be, since the Egyptians have kept an accurate record of their observations of this kind over a long period of terms. Since there is great difficulty in explaining the swelling of the river, many philosophers and historians have undertaken to set forth the causes of it. Regarding this we shall speak summarily, in order that we may neither make our digression too long, nor fail to record that which all men are curious to know. For on the general subject of the rise of the Nile and its sources, as well as on the manner in which it reaches the sea and the other points in which this, the largest river of the inhabited world, differs from all others, some historians have actually not ventured to say a single word, although want now and then to expatiate at length on some winter torrent or other, while others have undertaken to speak on these points of inquiry, but have strayed far from the truth. Hellanicus and Cadmus, for instance, as well as Hecateus and all the writers like them, belonging as they do one and all to the early school, turn to the answers offered by the myths, Herodotus, who was a curious inquirer if ever a man was, and widely acquainted with history, undertook, it is true, to give an explanation of the matter, but is now found to have followed contradictory guesses, Xenophon and Thucydides, who are praised for the accuracy of their histories completely refrained in their writings from any mention of the regions about Egypt, and Ephorus and Theopompus, who of all writers paid most attention to these matters, hit upon the truth the least. The error on the part of all these writers was due, not to their negligence, but to the peculiar character of the country. For from earliest times until Ptolemy, who was called Philadelphus, not only did no Greeks ever cross over into Ethiopia, but none ascended even as far as the boundaries of Egypt. To such an extent were all these regions inhospitable to foreigners and altogether dangerous. But after this king had made an expedition into Ethiopia with an army of Greeks, being the first to do so, the facts about that country from that time forth have been more accurately learned. Such, then, were the reasons for the ignorance of the earlier historians. 
and as for the sources of the Nile and the region where the stream arises, not a man, down to the time of the writing of this history, has ever affirmed that he has seen them, or reported from hearsay, an account received from any who have maintained that they have seen them. The question therefore resolves itself into a matter of guesswork and plausible conjecture, and when, for instance, the priests of Egypt assert that the Nile has its origin in the ocean which surrounds the inhabited world. There is nothing sound in what they say, and they are merely solving one perplexity by substituting another, and advancing as proof an explanation which itself stands much in need of proof. On the other hand, those troglodytes known as the Bolgi who migrated from the interior because of the heat say that there are certain phenomena connected with those regions, from which a man might reason that the body of the Nile is gathered from many sources which converge upon a single place, and that this is the reason for its being the most fertile of all known rivers. But the inhabitants of the country about the island called Mero, with whom a man would be most likely to agree, since they are far removed from the art of finding reasons in accordance with what is plausible and dwell nearest the regions under discussion are so far from saying anything accurate about these problems that they even call the river Astapus, which means, when translated into Greek, water from darkness. This people then have given the Nile a name which accords with the want of any first-hand information about those regions and with their own ignorance of them. But in our opinion the explanation nearest the truth is the one which is farthest from pure assumption. I am not unaware that Herodotus, when distinguishing between the Libya which lies to the east and that which lies to the west of this river, attributes to the Libyans known as the Nasimones the exact observation of the stream, and says that the Nile rises in a certain lake and then flows through the land of Ethiopia for a distance beyond telling, and yet assuredly no hasty assent should be given to the statements either of Libyans. Even though they may have spoken truthfully, or of the historian when what he says does not admit of proof, now that we have discussed the sources and course of the Nile, we shall endeavor to set forth the causes of its swelling. Talas, who is called one of the seven wise men, says that when the Etesian winds blow against the mouths of the river, they hinder the flow of the water into the sea, and that this is the reason why it rises and overflows Egypt, which is a low and level plain. But this explanation, plausible as it appears, may easily be shown to be false. For if what he said were true, all the rivers whose mouths face the Etesian winds would rise in a similar way. But since this is the case, nowhere in the inhabited world the true cause of the swelling must be sought. Elsewhere, Anaxagoras, the physical philosopher, has declared that the cause of the rising is the melting snow in Ethiopia, and the poet Euripides, a pupil of his, is in agreement with him. At least he writes. He quit Nile's waters, fairest that gush from earth, the Nile which, drawn from Ethiop land the black, Man's home flows with full flood when melts the snow. But the fact is that this statement also requires but a brief refutation, since it is clear to everyone that the excessive heat makes it impossible that any snow should fall in Ethiopia. For, speaking generally, in those regions there is no frost or cold or any sign whatsoever of winter, and this is especially true at the time of the rising of the Nile. And even if a man should admit the existence of great quantities of snow in the regions beyond Ethiopia, the falsity of the statement is still shown by this fact. Every river which flows out of the snow gives out cool breezes, as is generally agreed, and thickens the air about it. But the Nile is the only river about which no clouds form, and where no cool breezes rise and the air is not thickened. Herodotus says that the size of the Nile at its swelling is its natural one, but that as the sun travels over Libya in the winter it draws up to itself from the Nile a great amount of moisture. And this is the reason why at that season the river becomes smaller than its natural size, but at the beginning of summer, when the sun turns back in its course towards the north, it dries out and thus reduces the level of both the rivers of Greece and those of every other land whose geographical position is like that of Greece. Consequently, there is no occasion for surprise, he says, in the phenomenon of the Nile, for, as a matter of fact, it does not increase in volume in the hot season and then fall in the winter for the reason just given. Now the answer to be made to this explanation also is that it would follow that, if the sun drew moisture to itself from the Nile in the winter, it would also take some moisture from all the other rivers of Libya, and reduce the flow of their waters. But since nowhere in Libya is anything like this to be seen taking place, it is clear that the historian is caught inventing an explanation, 
for the fact is that the rivers of Greece increase in winter. Not because the sun is farther away, but by reason of the enormous rainfall. Democritus of Abera says that it is not the regions of the south that are covered with snow, but only those of the north, and that this is evident to everyone. The great quantities of heaped-up snow in the northern region still remain frozen until about the time of the winter solstice, but when in summer its solid masses are broken up by the heat. A great melting sets up, and this brings about the formation of many thick clouds in the higher altitudes, since the vapor rises upwards in large quantities. These clouds are then driven by the Etesian winds until they strike the highest mountains in the whole earth which, he says, are those of Ethiopia, then by their violent impact upon these peaks, lofty as they are. They cause torrential rains which swell the river, to the greatest extent at the season of the Etesian winds. But it is easy for anyone to refute this explanation also, if he will but note with precision the time when the increase of the river takes place for the Nile begins to swell at the summer solstice. When the Etesian winds are not yet blowing and commences to fall after the autumnal equinox, when the same winds have long since ceased. Whenever, therefore, the precise knowledge derived from experience prevails over the plausibility of mere argumentation, while we should recognize the man's ingenuity, yet no credence should be given to his statements. Indeed, I pass over the further fact that the Etesian winds can be seen to blow just as much from the west as from the north, since Borean and Aparxian winds are not the only winds which are called Etesian, but also the Argistean, which blow from the direction of the sun's summer setting. Also, the statement that by general agreement the highest mountains are those of Ethiopia is not only advanced without any proof, but it does not possess, either, the credibility which is accorded to facts established by observation. Ephorus, who presents the most recent explanation, endeavors to adduce a plausible argument, but as may be seen, by no means arrives at the truth, for he says that all Egypt, being alluvial soil and spongy, and in nature like pumice stone, is full of large and continuous cracks, through which it takes up a great amount of water. This it retains within itself during the winter season, but in the summer season it pours this out from itself everywhere like sweat as it were and by means of this exudation, it causes the flood of the river. But this historian, as it appears to us, has not only never personally observed the nature of the country in Egypt, but has not even inquired with any care about it of those who are acquainted with the character of this land. For in the first place, if the Nile derived its increase from Egypt itself, it would then not experience a flood in its upper stretches, where it flows through a stony and solid country. Yet, as a matter of fact, it floods while flowing over a course of more than 6,000 stades through Ethiopia before it ever touches Egypt. Secondly, if the stream of the Nile were on the one hand lower than the rifts in the alluvial soil, the cracks would then be on the surface, and so great an amount of water could not possibly remain in them. And if, on the other hand, the river occupied a higher level than the rifts, there could not possibly be a flow of water from the lower hollows to the higher surface. In general, can any man think it possible that the exudations from rifts in the ground should produce so great an increase in the waters of the river that practically all Egypt is inundated by it? For I pass over the false statements of Ephorus about the ground being alluvial and water being stored up in the rifts, since the refutation of them is manifest. For instance, the Meander River in Asia has laid down a great amount of alluvial land, yet not a single one of the phenomena attending the flooding of the Nile is to be seen in its case and like the meander the river in Akarnania known as the Akelos, and the Cephesus in Boeotia, which flows out of Phocis, have built up not a little land. And in the case of both, there is clear proof that the historian's statements are erroneous. However, under no circumstances would any man look for strict accuracy in Ephorus, when he sees that in many matters he has paid little regard for the truth. Certain of the wise men in Memphis have undertaken to advance an explanation of the flooding, which is incapable of disproof rather than credible, and yet it is accepted by many. They divide the earth into three parts, and say that one part is that which forms our inhabited world, that the second is exactly opposed to these regions in its seasons, and that the third lies between these two but is uninhabited by reason of the heat. Now if the Nile rose in the winter, it would be clear that it was receiving its additional waters from our zone because of the heavy rains which fall with us in that season especially. But since, on the contrary, its flood occurs in the summer, it is probable that in the regions opposite to us the winter storms are being produced, 
and that the surplus waters of those distant regions flow into our inhabited world. And it is for this reason that no man can journey to the sources of the Nile, because the river flows from the opposite zone through the uninhabited one. A further witness to this is the excessive sweetness of the water of the Nile, for in the course of the river through the torrid zone it is tempered by the heat, and that is the reason for its being the sweetest of all rivers. Inasmuch as by the law of nature that which is fiery always sweetens what is wet. But this explanation admits of an obvious rebuttal, for plainly it is quite impossible for a river to flow uphill into our inhabited world from the inhabited world opposite to ours. Especially if one holds to the theory that the earth is shaped like a sphere. And indeed, if any man makes bold to do violence, by means of mere words, to facts established by observation, nature at least will in no wise yield to him. For, in general, such men think that, by introducing a proposition incapable of being disproved and placing the uninhabited region between the two inhabited ones, they will in this way avoid all precise refutations of their argument. But the proper course for such as take a firm position on any matter is either to adduce the observed facts as evidence or to find there proofs in statements which have been agreed upon at the outset. But how can the Nile be the only river which flows from that inhabited world to our parts? For it is reasonable to suppose that other rivers as well are to be found there, just as there are many among us. Moreover, the cause which they advance for the sweetness of the water is altogether absurd. For if the river were sweetened by being tempered by the heat, it would not be so productive as it is of life, nor contain so many kinds of fishes and animals for all water upon being changed by the fiery element, is quite incapable of generating life. Therefore, since by the tempering process which they introduce they entirely change the real nature of the Nile, the causes which they advance for its flooding must be considered false. Oenopides of Chios says that in the summer the waters under the earth are cold, but in the winter, on the contrary, warm, and that this may be clearly observed in deep wells, for in midwinter their water is least cold while in the hottest weather the coldest water is drawn up from them. Consequently, it is reasonable that the Nile should be small and should diminish in the winter. Since the heat in the earth consumes the larger part of the moisture and there are no rains in Egypt, while in the summer, since there is no longer any consumption of the moisture down in the depths of the earth, the natural flow of the river is increased without hindrance. But the answer to be given to this explanation also is that there are many rivers in Libya, whose mouths are situated like those of the Nile, and whose courses are much the same. And yet they do not rise in the same manner as the Nile, on the contrary, flooding as they do in the winter and receding in the summer. They refute the false statement of any man who tries to overcome the truth with specious arguments. The nearest approach to the truth has been made by Agatharchides of Sinaitis. His explanation is as follows. Every year continuous rains fall in the mountains of Ethiopia from the summer solstice to the autumnal equinox, and so it is entirely reasonable that the Nile should diminish in the winter when it derives its natural supply of water solely from its sources, but should increase its volume in the summer on account of the rains which pour into it. And just because no one up to this time has been able to set forth the causes of the origin of the floodwaters, it is not proper, he urges, that his personal explanation be rejected for nature presents many contradictory phenomena, the exact causes of which are beyond the power of mankind to discover. As to his own statement, he adds, testimony to its truth is furnished by what takes place in certain regions of Asia. For on the borders of Scythia, which abut upon the Caucasus Mountains, annually, after the winter is over, exceptionally heavy snowstorms occur over many consecutive days. In the northern parts of India at certain seasons, hailstones come beating down which in size and quantity surpass belief. About the Hydaspes River, continuous rains fall at the opening of summer. And in Ethiopia, likewise, the same thing occurs some days later, this climatical condition in its regular recurrence, always causing storms in the neighboring regions. And so, he argues, it is nothing surprising if in Ethiopia as well, which lies above Egypt, continuous rains in the mountains, beating down in the summer, swell the river, especially since the plain fact itself is witnessed to by the barbarians who inhabit these regions. And if what has been said is of a nature opposite to what occurs among us, it should not be disbelieved on that score. For the south wind, for example, with us is accompanied by stormy weather, but in Ethiopia by clear skies, 
and in Europe the north winds are violent, but in that land they are gentle and light. With regard, then, to the flooding of the Nile, though we are able to answer with more varied arguments all who have offered explanations of it, we shall rest content with what has been said, in order that we may not overstep the principle of brevity which we resolved upon at the beginning. And since we have divided this book into two parts because of its length, inasmuch as we are aiming at due proportion in our account, at this point we shall close the first portion of our history. And in the second we shall set forth the facts in the history of Egypt which come next in order, beginning with the account of the former kings of Egypt and of the earliest manner of life among the Egyptians, the first book of Diodorus being divided because of its length into two volumes. The first contains the preface of the whole treatise and the accounts given by the Egyptians of the genesis of the world and the first forming of the universe. Then he tells of the gods who founded cities in Egypt and named them after themselves of the first men in the earliest manner of life, of the honor paid to the immortals and the building of their temples to them. Then of the topography of Egypt and the marvels related about the river Nile and also of the causes of its flooding and the opinions thereupon of the historians and the philosophers as well as the refutation of each writer. In this volume we shall discuss the topics which come next in order after the foregoing. We shall begin with the first kings of Egypt and set forth their individual deeds down to King Amasis, after we have first described in summary fashion the most ancient manner of life in Egypt. As for their means of living in primitive times, the Egyptians, they say, in the earliest period got their food from herbs and the stalks and roots of the plants which grew in the marshes, making trial of each one of them by tasting it, and the first one eaten by them and the most favored was that called agrostis, because it excelled the others in sweetness and supplied sufficient nutriment for the human body, for they observed that this plant was attractive to the cattle and quickly increased their bulk. Because of this fact, the natives, in remembrance of the usefulness of this plant, to this day, when approaching the gods, hold some of it in their hands as they pray to them, for they believe that man is a creature of swamp and marsh, basing this conclusion on the smoothness of his skin and his physical constitution, as well as on the fact that he requires a wet rather than a dry diet. A second way by which the Egyptians subsisted was, they say, by the eating of fish, of which the river provided a great abundance, especially at the time when it receded after its flood and dried up. They also ate the flesh of some of the pasturing animals, using for clothing the skins of the beasts that were eaten, and their dwellings they built out of reeds. And traces of these customs still remain among the herdsmen of Egypt, all of whom, they say, have no other dwelling up to this time than one of reeds, considering that with this they are well enough provided for. After subsisting in this manner over a long period of time, they finally turned to the edible fruits of the earth, among which may be included the bread made from the lotus. The discovery of these is attributed by some to Isis, but by others to one of their early kings called Menas. The priests, however, have the story that the discoverer of the branches of learning and of the arts was Hermes, but that it was their kings who discovered such things as are necessary for existence and that this was the reason why the kingship in early times was bestowed, not upon the sons of their former rulers, but upon such as conferred the greatest and most numerous benefits upon the peoples, whether it be that the inhabitants in this way sought to provoke their kings to useful service for the benefit of all, or that they have in very truth received an account to this effect in their sacred writings. Some of them give the story that at first gods and heroes ruled Egypt for a little less than 18,000 years, the last of the gods to rule being Horus. The son of Isis, and mortals have been kings over their country, they say, for a little less than 5,000 years down to the 180th Olympiad, the time when we visited Egypt and the king was Ptolemy, who took the name of the new Dionysus. For most of this period the rule was held by native kings, and for a small part of it by Ethiopians, Persians, and Macedonians. Now four Ethiopians held the throne, not consecutively but with intervals between, for a little less than thirty-six years in all, and the Persians, after their king Cambyses had subdued the nation by arms, ruled for a hundred and thirty-five years, including the periods of revolt on the part of the Egyptians which they raised because they were unable to endure the harshness of their dominion and their lack of respect for. The Native Gods Last of all, the Macedonians and their dynasty held rule for two hundred and seventy-six years. For the rest of the time all the kings of the land were natives, four hundred and seventy of them being men and five women. 
About all of them, the priests had records which were regularly handed down in their sacred books to each successive priest from early times, giving the stature of each of the former kings, a description of his character, and what he had done during his reign. As for us, however, it would be a long task to write of each of them severally, and superfluous also, seeing that most of the material included is of no profit. Consequently, we shall undertake to recount briefly only the most important of the facts which deserve a place in history. After the gods, the first king of Egypt, according to the priests, was Menes, who taught the people to worship gods and offer sacrifices, and also to supply themselves with tables and couches and to use costly bedding, and in a word, introduced luxury and an extravagant manner of life. For this reason, when many generations later, Tonaphactus, the father of Bocorus the Wise, was king and, while on a campaign in Arabia, ran short of supplies because the country was desert and rough. We are told that he was obliged to go without food for one day, and then to live on quite simple fare at the home of some ordinary folk in private station, and that he, enjoying the experience exceedingly, denounced luxury and pronounced a curse on the king who had first taught the people their extravagant way of living, and so deeply did he take to heart the change which, had taken place in the people's habits of eating, drinking, and sleeping, that he inscribed his curse in hieroglyphs on the temple of Zeus in Thebes, and this, in fact, appears to be the chief reason why the fame of Menes and his honors did not persist into later ages. And it is said that the descendants of this king, fifty-two in number all told, ruled in unbroken succession more than a thousand and forty years, but that in their reigns nothing occurred that was worthy of record. Subsequently, when Busiris became king and his descendants in turn, eight in name, the last of the line, who bore the same name as the first, founded, they say, the city which the Egyptians called Diospolis the Great, though the Greeks call it Thebes. Now the circuit of it he made a hundred and forty stades, and he adorned it in marvelous fashion with great buildings and remarkable temples and dedicatory monuments of every other kind, in the same way. He caused the houses of private citizens to be constructed in some cases four stories high, in others five, and in general made it the most prosperous city, not only of Egypt, but of the whole world. And since, by reason of the city's preeminent wealth and power, its fame has been spread abroad to every region, even the poet, we are told, has mentioned it when he says, Nay, not for all the wealth, of Thebes in Egypt, where in Ivory Hall, there lieth treasure vast, a hundred are, her gates, and warriors by each issue forth, two hundred, each of them with car and steeds. Some, however, tell us that it was not one hundred percent gates, pulai, which the city had, but rather many great propylaea in front of its temples, and that it was from these that the title hundred gated was given it, that is, having many gateways. Yet twenty thousand chariots did in truth, we are told, pass out from it to war, where there were once scattered along the river from Memphis to the Thebes, which is over against Libya, one hundred post stations, each one having accommodation for two hundred horses, whose foundations are pointed out even to this day. Not only this king we have been informed, but also many of the later rulers devoted their attention to the development of the city. For no city under the sun has ever been so adorned by votive offerings, made of silver and gold and ivory, in such number and of such size, by such a multitude of colossal statues, and finally, by obelisks made of single blocks of stone. Of four temples erected there, the oldest is a source of wonder for both its beauty and size, having a circuit of thirteen stades, a height of forty-five cubits, and walls twenty-four feet thick. In keeping with this magnificence was also the embellishment of the votive offerings within the circuit wall, marvelous for the money spent upon it, and exquisitely wrought as to workmanship. Now the buildings of the temple survive down to rather recent times, but the silver and gold and costly works of ivory and rare stone were carried off by the Persians when Cambyses burned the temples of Egypt. And it was at this time, they say, that the Persians, by transferring all this wealth to Asia and taking artisans along from Egypt, constructed their famous palaces in Persepolis and Susa and throughout Media. So great was the wealth of Egypt at that period, they declare, that from the remnants left in the course of the sack and after the burning the treasure which was collected little by little was found to be worth more than three hundred talents of gold and no less than two thousand three hundred talents of silver. 
There are also in this city, they say, remarkable tombs of the early kings and of their successors, which leave to those who aspire to similar magnificence no opportunity to outdo them. Now the priests said that in their records they find forty-seven tombs of kings. But down to the time of Ptolemy son of Lagus, they say, only fifteen remained, most of which had been destroyed at the time we visited those regions in the 180th Olympiad. Not only do the priests of Egypt give these facts from their records, but many also of the Greeks who visited Thebes in the time of Ptolemy son of Lagus and composed histories of Egypt, one of whom was Hecateus, agree with what we have said. Ten stades from the first tombs, he says, in which, according to tradition, are buried the concubines of Zeus, stands a monument of the king known as Osimandias. At its entrance there is a pylon, constructed of variegated stone, two plethora in breadth and forty-five cubits high. Passing through this one enters a rectangular peristyle, built of stone. Four plethora long on each side, it is supported, in place of pillars, by monolithic figures sixteen cubits high, wrought in the ancient manner as to shape, and the entire ceiling, which is two fathoms wide, consists of a single stone, which is highly decorated with stars on a blue field. Beyond this peristyle there is yet another entrance and pylon, in every respect like the one mentioned before, save that it is more richly wrought with every manner of relief. Beside the entrance are three statues, each of a single block of black stone from Sin, of which one, that is seated, is the largest of any in Egypt, the foot measuring over seven cubits, while the other two at the knees of this. The one on the right and the other on the left, daughter and mother respectively, are smaller than the one first mentioned. And it is not merely for its size that this work merits approbation, but it is also marvelous by reason of its artistic quality and excellent because of the nature of the stone. Since in a block of so great a size there is not a single crack or blemish to be seen, the inscription upon it runs, King of kings am I, Osimandias. If anyone would know how great I am and where I lie, let him surpass one of my works. There is also another statue of his mother standing alone, a monolith twenty cubits high, and it has three diadems on its head, signifying that she was both daughter and wife and mother of a king. Beyond the pylon, he says, there is a peristyle more remarkable than the former one. In it there are all manner of reliefs depicting the war which the king waged against those Bactrians who had revolted. Against these he had made a campaign with 400,000 foot soldiers and 20,000 cavalry, the whole army having been divided into four divisions, all of which were under the command of sons of the king. On the first wall the king, he says, is represented in the act of besieging a walled city which is surrounded by a river, and of leading the attack against opposing troops, he is accompanied by a lion, which is aiding him with terrifying effect. Of those who have explained the scene, some have said that in very truth a tame lion which the king kept accompanied him in the perils of battle and put the enemy to rout by his fierce onset, but others have maintained that the king, who was exceedingly brave and desirous of praising himself in a vulgar way, was trying to portray his own bold spirit in the figure of a lion. On the second wall, he adds, are wrought the captives as they are being led away by the king. They are without their privates and their hands which apparently signifies that they were effeminate in spirit and had no hands when it came to the dread business of warfare. The third wall carries every manner of relief and excellent paintings, which portray the king performing a sacrifice of oxen and celebrating a triumph after the war. In the center of the peristyle there had been constructed of the most beautiful stone and altar, open to the sky, both excellent in its workmanship and marvelous because of its size. By the last wall are two monolithic seated statues, twenty-seven cubits high, beside which are set three entrances from the peristyle, and by way of these entrances one comes into a hall whose roof was supported by pillars, constructed in the style of an odium, and measuring two plethora on each side. In this hall there are many wooden statues representing parties in litigation, whose eyes are fixed upon the judges who decide their cases, and these in turn are shown in relief on one of the walls. To the number of thirty, and without any hands, and in their midst the chief justice, with a figure of truth hanging from his neck and holding his eyes closed, and at his side a great number of books. And these figures show by their attitude that the judges shall receive no gift, and that the chief justice shall have his eyes upon the truth alone. Next to these courts, he says, is an ambulatory crowded with buildings of every kind, in which there are representations of the foods that are sweetest to the taste, of every variety. 
Here are to be found reliefs in which the king, adorned in colors, is represented as offering to the god the gold and silver which he received each year from the silver and gold mines of all Egypt, and an inscription below gives also the total amount, which, summed up according to its value in silver, is thirty-two million minas. Next comes the sacred library, which bears the inscription, Healing Place of the Soul, and contiguous to this building are statues of all the gods of Egypt to each of whom the king in like manner makes the offering appropriate to him. As though he were submitting proof before Osiris and his assessors in the underworld that to the end of his days he had lived a life of piety and justice towards both men and gods. Next to the library and separated from it by a party wall is an exquisitely constructed hall, which contains a table with couches for twenty and statues of Zeus and Hera as well as of the king. Here, it would seem, the body of the king is also buried. In a circle about this building are many chambers which contain excellent paintings of all the animals which are held sacred in Egypt. There is an ascent leading through these chambers to the tomb as a whole. At the top of this ascent there is a circular border of gold crowning the monument, 365 cubits in circumference and one cubit thick. Upon this the days of the year are inscribed. One in each cubit of length, and by each day the risings and settings of the stars as nature ordains them, and the signs indicating the effects which the Egyptian astrologers hold that they produce. This border, they said, had been plundered by Cambyses and the Persians when he conquered Egypt. Such, they say, was the tomb of Osimandias the king, which is considered far to have excelled all others, not only in the amount of money lavished upon it, but also in the ingenuity shown by the artificers. The Thebans say that they are the earliest of all men, and the first people among whom philosophy and the exact science of the stars were discovered, since their country enables them to observe more distinctly than others the rising and settings of the stars. Peculiar to them also is their ordering of the months and years, for they do not reckon the days by the moon but by the sun, making their month of thirty days, and they add five and a quarter days to the twelve months, and in this way fill out the cycle of the year but they do not intercalate months or subtract days, as most of the Greeks do. They appear to have made careful observations of the eclipses both of the sun and of the moon, and predict them, foretelling without error all the events which actually occur. Of the descendants of this king, the eighth, known as Eucorius, founded Memphis, the most renowned city of Egypt, for he chose the most favorable spot in all the land where the Nile divides into several branches to form the delta, as it is called from its shape. And the result was that the city, excellently situated as it was at the gates of the delta, continually controlled the commerce passing into Upper Egypt. Now he gave the city a circumference of a hundred and fifty stades, and made it remarkably strong and adapted to its purpose by works of the following nature. Since the Nile flowed around the city and covered it at the time of inundation, he threw out a huge mound of earth on the south to serve as a barrier against the swelling of the river and also as a citadel against the attacks of enemies by land. And all around the other sides he dug a large and deep lake, which, by taking up the force of the river and occupying all the space about the city except where the mound had been thrown up, gave it remarkable strength. And so happily did the founder of the city reckon upon the suitableness of the site that practically all subsequent kings left Thebes and established both their palaces and official residences here. Consequently, from this time, Thebes began to wane and Memphis to increase until the time of Alexander the king, for after he had founded the city on the sea which bears his name. All the kings of Egypt after him concentrated their interest on the development of it. Some adorned it with magnificent palaces, some with docks and harbors, and others with further notable dedications and buildings, to such an extent that it is generally reckoned the first or second city of the inhabited world. But a detailed description of this city we shall set forth in the appropriate period. The founder of Memphis, after constructing the mound and the lake, erected a palace which, while not inferior to those of other nations, yet was no match for the grandeur of design and love of the beautiful shown by the kings who preceded him. For the inhabitants of Egypt consider the period of this life to be of no account whatever, but place the greatest value on the time after death when they will be remembered for their virtue. And while they give the name of lodgings to the dwellings of the living, thus intimating that we dwell in them but a brief time, they call the tombs of the dead eternal homes. 
Since the dead spend endless eternity in Hades, consequently they give less thought to the furnishings of their houses, but on the manner of their burials they do not forgo any excess of zeal. The aforementioned city was named, according to some, after the daughter of the king who founded it. They tell the story that she was loved by the river Nile, who had assumed the form of a bull, and gave birth to Egyptus, a man famous among the natives for his virtue, from whom the entire land received its name. For upon succeeding to the throne he showed himself to be a kindly king, just and, in a word, upright in all matters and so, since he was held by all to merit great approbation because of his goodwill, he received the honor mentioned. Twelve generations after the king just named, Moeris succeeded to the throne of Egypt and built in Memphis itself the North Propylaea, which far surpasses the others in magnificence. While ten shoni above the city he excavated a lake which was remarkable for its utility and an undertaking of incredible magnitude. For its circumference, they say, is three thousand six hundred stades and its depth in most parts fifty fathoms, what man, accordingly, in trying to estimate the magnitude of the work, would not reasonably inquire how many myriads of men laboring for how many years were required for its completion. And as for the utility of this lake and its contribution to the welfare of all the inhabitants of Egypt, as well as for the ingenuity of the king, no man may praise them highly enough to do justice to the truth. For since the Nile did not rise to a fixed height every year, and yet the fruitfulness of the country depended on the constancy of the flood level, he excavated the lake to receive the excess water, in order that the river might not, by an excessive volume of flow, immoderately flood the land and form marshes and pools, nor, by failing to rise to the proper height, ruin the harvests by the lack of water. He also dug a canal, eighty stades long and three plethora wide, from the river to the lake, and by this canal, sometimes turning the river into the lake, and sometimes shutting it off again. He furnished the farmers with an opportune supply of water, opening and closing the entrance by a skillful device, and yet at considerable expense, for it cost no less than fifty talents if a man wanted to open, or close this work. The lake has continued to serve well the needs of the Egyptians down to our time, and bears the name of its builder being called to this day the Lake of Moeris. Now the king, in excavating it, left a spot in the center, where he built a tomb and two pyramids a stade in height, one for himself and the other for his wife, on the tops of which he placed stone statues seated upon thrones, thinking that by these monuments he would leave behind him an imperishable commemoration of his good deeds. The income accruing from the fish taken from the lake he gave to his wife for her unguents and general embellishment. The value of the catch amounting to a talent of silver daily for there are twenty-two different kinds of fish in the lake, they say, and they are caught in such abundance that the people engaged in salting them, though exceedingly many, can scarcely keep up with their task. Now this is the account which the Egyptians give of Moeris. Sisosis, they say, who became king seven generations later, performed more renowned and greater deeds than did any of his predecessors. And since, with regard to this king, not only are the Greek writers at variance with one another, but also among the Egyptians the priests and the poets who sing his praises give conflicting stories. We, for our part, shall endeavor to give the most probable account, and that which most nearly agrees with the monuments still standing in the land. Now, at the birth of Sisosis, his father did a thing worthy of a great man and a king. Gathering together from over all Egypt the male children which had been born on the same day, and assigning them nurses and guardians, he prescribed the same training and education for them all, on the theory that those who had been reared in the closest companionship and had enjoyed the same frank relationship would be most loyal and as fellow combatants in the wars most brave. He amply provided for their every need and then trained the youths by unremitting exercises and hardships, for no one of them was allowed to have anything to eat unless he had first run one hundred and eighty stades. Consequently, upon attaining to manhood, they were all veritable athletes of robustness of body, and in spirit qualified for leadership and endurance because of the training which they had received in the most excellent pursuits. First of all, Sisosis, his companions also accompanying him, was sent by his father with an army into Arabia, where he was subjected to the laborious training of hunting wild animals, and, after hardening himself to the privations of thirst and hunger, conquered the entire nation of the Arabs which had never been enslaved before his day, and then, on being sent to the regions to the west, he subdued the larger part of Libya, 
though in years still no more than a youth. And when he ascended the throne upon the death of his father, being filled with confidence by reason of his earlier exploits he undertook to conquer the inhabited earth. There are those who say that he was urged to acquire empire over the whole world by his own daughter Athertis, who, according to some, was far more intelligent than any of her day and showed her father that the campaign would be an easy one, while according to others she had the gift of prophecy and knew beforehand. By means both of sacrifices and the practice of sleeping in temples, as well as from the signs which appear in the heavens, what would take place in the future. Some have also written that, at the birth of Sisosis, his father had thought that Hephaestus had appeared to him in a dream and told him that the son who had been born would rule over the whole civilized world, and that for this reason, therefore, his father collected the children of the same age as his son and granted them a royal training, thus preparing them beforehand for an attack upon the whole world. And that his son, upon attaining manhood, trusting in the prediction of the god, was led to undertake this campaign. In preparation for this undertaking, he first of all confirmed the goodwill of all the Egyptians towards himself, feeling it to be necessary, if he were to bring his plan to a successful end, that his soldiers on the campaign should be ready to die for their leaders, and that those left behind in their native lands should not rise in revolt. He therefore showed kindnesses to everyone by all means at his disposal, winning over some by presents of money, others by gifts of land, and others by remission of penalties and the entire people he attached to himself by his friendly intercourse and kindly ways, for he set free unharmed everyone who was held for some crime against the king and cancelled the obligations of those who were in prison for debt, there being a great multitude in the Gauls, and dividing the entire land into thirty-six parts which the Egyptians call gnomes, he set over each a nomarch, who should superintend the collection of the royal revenues and administer all the affairs of his division. He then chose out the strongest of the men and formed an army worthy of the greatness of his undertaking, for he enlisted 600,000 foot soldiers, 24,000 cavalry, and 27,000 war chariots. In command of the several divisions of his troops he set his companions, who were by this time inured to warfare, had striven for a reputation for valor from their youth, and cherished with a brotherly love both their king and one another, the number of them being over 1,700. And upon all these commanders he bestowed allotments of the best land in Egypt in order that, enjoying sufficient income and lacking nothing, they might sedulously practice the art of war. After he had made ready his army, he marched first of all against the Ethiopians who dwell south of Egypt, and after conquering them he forced that people to pay a tribute in ebony. Gold and the tusks of elephants. Then he sent out a fleet of four hundred ships into the Red Sea, being the first Egyptian to build warships and not only took possession of the islands in those waters, but also subdued the coast of the mainland as far as India, while he himself made his way by land with his army and subdued all Asia. Not only did he in fact visit the territory which was afterwards won by Alexander of Macedon, but also certain peoples into whose country Alexander did not cross. For he even passed over the river Ganges and visited all of India as far as the ocean, as well as the tribes of the Scythians as far as the river Tanas, which divides Europe from Asia, and it was at this time. They say that some of the Egyptians, having been left behind near the Lake Myotis, founded the nation of the Colchi. And the proof which they offer of the Egyptian origin of this nation is the fact that the Colchi practice circumcision even as the Egyptians do, the custom continuing among the colonists sent out from Egypt as it also did in the case of the Jews. In the same way he brought all the rest of Asia into subjection as well as most of the Cyclades islands. And after he had crossed into Europe and was on his way through the whole length of Thrace, he nearly lost his army through lack of food and the difficult nature of the land. Consequently, he fixed the limits of his expedition in Thrace, and set up stelae in many parts of the regions which he had acquired, and these carried the following inscription in the Egyptian writing which is, called Sacred. This land, the king of kings and lord of lords, Sesosis, subdued with his own arms, and he fashioned the stale with a representation, in case the enemy people were warlike of the privy parts of a man, but in case they were abject and cowardly, of those of a woman, holding that the quality of the spirit of each people would be set forth most clearly to succeeding generations by the dominant member of the body. And in some places he also erected a stone statue of himself, armed with bow and arrows and a spear, in height four cubits and four palms, which was indeed his own stature. 
He dealt gently with all conquered peoples, and after concluding his campaign in nine years, commanded the nations to bring presents each year to Egypt according to their ability while he himself, assembling a multitude of captives which has never been surpassed and a mass of other booty, returned to his country, having accomplished the greatest deeds of any king of Egypt to his day. All the temples of Egypt, moreover, he adorned with notable votive offerings and spoils, and honored with gifts according to his merits every soldier who had distinguished himself for bravery. And in general, as a result of this campaign, not only did the army, which had bravely shared in the deeds of the king and had gathered great wealth, make a brilliant homeward journey, but it also came to pass that all Egypt was filled to overflowing with benefits of every kind. Sassosus now relieved his peoples of the labors of war and granted to the comrades who had bravely shared in his deeds a carefree life in the enjoyment of the good things which they had won. While he himself, being ambitious for glory and intent upon everlasting fame, constructed works which were great and marvelous in their conception, as well as in the lavishness with which their cost was provided, winning in this way immortal glory for himself, and for the Egyptians' security combined with ease for all time. For beginning with the gods first, he built in each city of Egypt a temple to the god who was held in special reverence by its inhabitants. On these labors he used no Egyptians, but constructed them all by the hands of his captives alone. And for this reason he placed an inscription on every temple that no native had toiled upon it. And it is said that the captives brought from Babylonia revolted from the king, being unable to endure the hardships entailed by his works, and they, seizing a strong position on the banks of the river, maintained a warfare against the Egyptians and ravaged the neighboring territory, but finally, on being granted an amnesty, they established a colony on the spot, which they also named Babylon after their native land. For a similar reason, they say, the city of Troy likewise, which even to this day exists on the bank of the Nile, received its name from Menelaus on his voyage from Ilium with a great number of captives crossed over into Egypt, and the Trojans, revolting from him, seized a certain place and maintained a warfare until he granted them safety and freedom, whereupon they founded a city to which they gave the name of their native land. I am not unaware that regarding the cities named above, Theseus of Sinaitis has given a different account, saying that some of those who had come into Egypt with Semirames founded them, calling them after their native lands. But on such matters as these it is not easy to set forth the precise truth, and yet the disagreements among historians must be considered worthy of record, in order that the reader may be able to decide upon the truth without prejudice. Now Sesosus threw up many great mounds of earth and moved to them such cities as happened to be situated on ground that was not naturally elevated, in order that at the time of the flooding of the river both the inhabitants and their herds might have a safe place of retreat. And over the entire land from Memphis to the sea he dug frequent canals leading from the river, his purpose being that the people might carry out the harvesting of their crops quickly and easily, and that, through the constant intercourse of the peasants with one another, every district might enjoy both an easy livelihood and a great abundance of all things which minister to man's enjoyment. The greatest result of this work, however, was that he made the country secure and difficult of access against attacks by enemies, for practically all the best part of Egypt, which before this time had been easy of passage for horses and carts, has from that time on been very difficult for an enemy to invade by reason of the great number of canals leading from the river. He also fortified with a wall the side of Egypt which faces east as a defense against inroads from Syria and Arabia. The wall extended through the desert from Pelusium to Heliopolis, and its length was some fifteen hundred stades. Moreover, he also built a ship of cedar wood, which was 280 cubits long, and plated on the exterior with gold and on the interior with silver. This ship he presented as a votive offering to the god who is held in special reverence in Thebes, as well as two obelisks of hard stone 120 cubits high, upon which he inscribed the magnitude of his army, the multitude of his revenues, and the number of the peoples he had subdued. Also in Memphis, in the temples of Hephaestus, he dedicated monolithic statues of himself and of his wife, thirty cubits high, and of his sons. Twenty cubits high, the occasion of their erection being as follows. When Sesosus had returned to Egypt after his great campaign and was tarrying at Pelusium, his brother, who was entertaining Sesosus and his wife and children, plotted against them. 
for when they had fallen asleep after the drinking, he piled great quantities of dry rushes, which he had kept in readiness for some time, around the tent in the night and set them afire. When the fire suddenly blazed up, those who had been assigned to wait upon the king came to his aid in a churlish fashion, as would men heavy with wine, but Sesosis, raising both hands to the heavens with a prayer to the gods for the preservation of his children and wife, dashed out safe through the flames. For this unexpected escape he honored the rest of the gods with votive offerings, as stated above, and Hephaestus most of all, on the ground that it was by his intervention that he had been saved. Although many great deeds have been credited to Sesosis, his magnificence seems best to have been shown in the treatment which he accorded to the foreign potentates when he went forth from his palace. The kings whom he had allowed to continue their rule over the peoples which he had subdued, and all others who had received from him the most important positions of command, would present themselves in Egypt at specified times bringing him gifts, and the king would welcome them and in all other matters show them honor and special preferment. But whenever he intended to visit a temple or city, he would remove the horses from his four-horse chariot and in their place yoke the kings and other potentates, taking them four at a time, in this way showing to all men, as he thought, that, having conquered the mightiest of other kings and those most renowned for their excellence, he now had no one who could compete with him for the prize of excellence. This king is thought to have surpassed all former rulers in power and military exploits, and also in the magnitude a number of the votive offerings and public works which he built in Egypt. And after a reign of thirty-three years he deliberately took his own life, his eyesight having failed him, and this act won for him the admiration not only of the priests of Egypt, but of the other inhabitants as well. For it was thought that he had caused the end of his life to comport with the loftiness of spirit shown in his achievements. So great became the fame of this king, and so enduring through the ages that when, many generations later, Egypt fell under the power of the Persians and Darius, the father of Xerxes, was bent upon placing a statue of himself in Memphis before that of Cesosis, the chief priest opposed it in a speech which he made in an assembly of the priests, to the effect that Darius had not yet surpassed the deeds of Cesosis, and the king was far from being angered, but on the contrary, being pleased at his frankness of speech said that he would strive not to be found behind that ruler in any point when he had attained his years, and asked them to base their judgment upon the deeds of each at the same age. For that was the fairest test of their excellence. As regards Sesosis, then, we shall rest content with what has been said. But his son, succeeding to the throne and assuming his father's appellation, did not accomplish a single thing in war or otherwise worthy of mention, though he did have a singular experience. He lost his sight either because he shared in his father's bodily constitution, or, as some fictitiously relate, because of his impiety towards the river. Since once when caught in a storm upon it he had hurled a spear into the rushing current. Forced by this ill fortune to turn to the gods for aid, he strove over a long period to propitiate the deity by numerous sacrifices and honors, but received no consideration. But in the tenth year an oracular command was given to him to do honor to the god in Heliopolis, and bathe his face in the urine of a woman who had never known any other man than her husband. Thereupon he began with his own wife and made trial of many, but found not one that was chaste save a certain gardener's wife, whom he married as soon as he was recovered. All the other women he burned alive in a certain village to which the Egyptians, because of this incident, gave the name Holy Field, and to the god in Heliopolis, out of gratitude for his benefaction. He dedicated, in accordance with the injunction of the oracle, two monolithic obelisks, eight cubits wide and one hundred high. After this king, a long line of successors on the throne accomplished no deed worth recording. But Amasis, who became king many generations later, ruled the masses of the people with great harshness. Many he punished unjustly, great numbers he deprived of their possessions, and towards all his conduct was without exception contemptuous and arrogant. Now, for a time, his victims bore up under this, being unable in any way to protect themselves against those of greater power. But when Actisanes, the king of the Ethiopians, led an army against Amasis, their hatred seized the opportunity, and most of the Egyptians revolted. As a consequence, since he was easily overcome, Egypt fell under the rule of the Ethiopians. But Actisanes carried his good fortune as a man should and conducted himself in a kindly manner towards his subjects. 
For instance, he had his own manner of dealing with thieves, neither putting to death such as were liable to that punishment, nor letting them go with no punishment at all. For after he had gathered together out of the whole land those who were charged with some crime and had held a thoroughly fair examination of their cases, he took all who had been judged guilty and, cutting off their noses, settled them in a colony on the edge of the desert, founding the city which was called Rhinocolura after the lot of its inhabitants. This city, which lies on the border between Egypt and Syria not far from the sea coast, is wanting in practically everything which is necessary for man's existence for it is surrounded by land which is full of brine, while within the walls there is but a small supply of water from wells. And this is impure and very bitter to the taste. But he settled them in this country in order that, in case they continued to practice their original manner of life, they might not prey upon innocent people. And also that they might not pass unrecognized as they mingled with the rest of mankind. And yet, despite the fact that they had been cast out into a desert country which lacked practically every useful thing, they contrived a way of living appropriate to the dearth about them, since nature forced them to devise every possible means to combat their destitution. For instance, by cutting down reeds in the neighborhood and splitting them, they made long nets, which they set up along the beach for a distance of many stades and hunted quails, for these are driven in large coveys from the open sea and in hunting them they caught a sufficient number to provide themselves with food. After the death of this king, the Egyptians regained the control of their government and placed on the throne a native king, Mendes, whom some call Maris. So far as war is concerned, this ruler did not accomplish anything at all, but he did build himself a tomb known as the Labyrinth, which was not so remarkable for its size as it was impossible to imitate in respect to its ingenious design. For a man who enters it, cannot easily find his way out, unless he gets a guide who is thoroughly acquainted with the structure. And some say that Daedalus, visiting Egypt and admiring the skill shown in the building, also constructed for Minos, the king of Crete, a labyrinth like the one in Egypt in which was kept. As the myth relates, the beast called Minotaur. However, the labyrinth in Crete has entirely disappeared, whether it be that some ruler raised it to the ground or that time effaced the work but the one in Egypt has stood intact in its entire structure down to our lifetime. After the death of this king, there were no rulers for five generations, and then a man of obscure origin was chosen king, whom the Egyptians call Cetes, but who among the Greeks is thought to be that Proteus who lived at the time of the war about Ilium. Some tradition records that this Proteus was experienced in the knowledge of the winds and that he would change his body, sometimes into the form of different animals, sometimes into a tree or fire or something else. And it so happens that the account which the priests give of Cetes is in agreement with that tradition. For, according to the priests, from the close association which the king constantly maintained with the astrologers, he had gained experience in such matters and from a custom which has been passed down among the kings of Egypt has arisen the myths current among the Greeks about the way Proteus changed his shape. For it was a practice among the rulers of Egypt to wear upon their heads the forepart of a lion or bull or snake as symbols of their rule, at times also trees or fire. And in some cases they even carried on their heads large bunches of fragrant herbs for incense, these last serving to enhance their comeliness and at the same time to fill all other men with fear and religious awe. On the death of Proteus, his son Remphis succeeded to the throne. This ruler spent his whole life looking after the revenues and amassing riches from every source, and because of his niggardly and miserly character spent nothing either on votive offerings to the gods or on benefactions to the inhabitants. Consequently, since he had been not so much a king as only an efficient steward, in the place of a fame based upon virtue, he left a treasure larger than that of any king before him, for according to tradition he amassed some four hundred thousand talents of silver and gold. After Remphis died, kings succeeded to the throne for seven generations, who were confirmed sluggards and devoted only to indulgence and luxury. Consequently, in the priestly records, no costly building of theirs nor any deed worthy of historical record is handed down in connection with them, except in the case of one ruler, Nilius, from whom the river came to be named the Nile, though formerly called Aegyptus. This ruler constructed a very great number of canals at opportune places, and in many ways showed himself eager to increase the usefulness of the Nile, and therefore became the cause of the present appellation of the river.
The eighth king, Chemis of Memphis, ruled fifty years and constructed the largest of the three pyramids, which are numbered among the seven wonders of the world. These pyramids, which are situated on the side of Egypt, which is towards Libya, are a hundred and twenty stades from Memphis and forty-five from the Nile. And by the immensity of their structures and the skill shown in their execution, they fill the beholder with wonder and astonishment. For the largest is in the form of a square and has a base length on each side of seven plethora and a height of over six plethora. It also gradually tapers to the top, where each side is six cubits long. The entire construction is of hard stone, which is difficult to work but lasts forever. For though no fewer than a thousand years have elapsed, as they say, to our lifetime, or as some writers have it, more than 3,400 the stones remain to this day still preserving their original position and the entire structure undecayed. It is said that the stone was conveyed over a great distance from Arabia and that the construction was effected by means of mounds. Since cranes had not yet been invented at that time, and the most remarkable thing in the account is that, though the constructions were on such a great scale and the country round about them consists of nothing but sand, not a trace remains either of any mound or of the dressing of the stones, so that they do not have the appearance of being the slow handiwork of men but look like a sudden creation, as though they had been made by some god and set down bodily in the surrounding sand. Certain Egyptians would make a marvel out of these things, saying that, inasmuch as the mounds were built of salt and saltpetre, when the river was let in it melted them down and completely effaced them without the intervention of man's hand. However, there is not a word of truth in this, but the entire material for the mounds, raised as they were by the labor of many hands, was returned by the same means to the place from which it came, for 360,000 men, as they say, were employed on the undertaking, and the whole structure was scarcely completed in twenty years. Upon the death of this king, his brother Sephron succeeded to the throne and ruled fifty-six years, but some say that it was not the brother of Chemiz, but his son, named Chibrais, who took the throne. All writers, however, agree that it was the next ruler who, emulating the example of his predecessor, built the second pyramid, which was the equal of the one just mentioned in the skill displayed in its execution but far behind it in size, since its base length on each side is only a stade. And an inscription on the larger pyramid gives the sum of money expended on it. Since the writing sets forth that on vegetables and purgatives for the workmen there were paid out over sixteen hundred talents, the smaller bears no inscription but has steps cut into one side. And though the two kings built the pyramids to serve as their tombs, in the event neither of them was buried in them, for the multitudes because of the hardships which they had endured in the building of them, and the many cruel and violent acts of these kings, were filled with anger against those who had caused their sufferings and openly threatened to tear their bodies asunder and cast them in despite out of the tombs. Consequently, each ruler, when dying, enjoined upon his kinsmen to bury his body secretly in an unmarked place. After these rulers Miserinus, to whom some give the name Mencherinus, a son of the builder of the first pyramid, became king. He undertook the construction of a third pyramid, but died before the entire structure had been completed. The base length of each side he made three plethora, and for fifteen courses he built the walls of black stone like that found about Thebes. But the rest of it he filled out with stone like that found in the other pyramids. In size this structure falls behind those mentioned above, but far surpasses them in the skill displayed in its execution and the great cost of the stone and on the north side of the pyramid is an inscription, stating that its builder was Maserinus. This ruler, they say, out of indignation at the cruelty of his predecessors, aspired to live an honorable life, and one devoted to the welfare of his subjects, and he continually did many other things which might best help to evoke the goodwill of the people towards himself, and more especially when he gave audiences, he spent a great amount of money giving presents to such honest men as he thought had not fared in the courts of law as they deserved. There are also three more pyramids, each of which is one plethrum long on each side and in general construction is like the others save in size. And these pyramids, they say, were built by the three kings named above for their wives. It is generally agreed that these monuments far surpass all other constructions in Egypt, not only in their massiveness and cost, but also in the skill displayed by their builders. And they say that the architects of the monuments are more deserving of admiration than the kings who furnished the means for their execution.
for in bringing their plans to completion the former called upon their individual souls and their zeal for honor, but the latter only used the wealth which they had inherited and the grievous toil of other men. But with regard to the pyramids there is no complete agreement among either the inhabitants of the country or the historians, for according to some the kings mentioned above were the builders. According to others they were different kings. For instance, it is said that Armaeus built the largest, Amosis the second, and Inaros the third. And this last pyramid, some say, is the tomb of the courtesan Rhodopis, for some of the nomarchs became her lovers, as the account goes, and out of their passion for her carried the building through to completion as a joint undertaking. After the kings mentioned above Bokoris succeeded to the throne, a man who was altogether contemptible in personal appearance but in sagacity far surpassed all former kings. Much later Egypt was ruled by Sabaco, who was by birth an Ethiopian, and yet in piety and uprightness far surpassed his predecessors. A proof of his goodness may be found in his abolition of the severest one of the customary penalties, I refer to the taking of life, for instead of executing the condemned he put them in chains at forced labor. For the cities, and by their services constructed many dikes, and dug out not a few well-placed canals for he held that in this way he had reduced for those who were being chastised the severity of their punishment. While for the cities he had procured, in exchange for useless penalties, something of great utility, and the excessiveness of his piety may be inferred from a vision which he had in a dream and his consequent abdication of the throne. For he thought that the god of Thebes told him while he slept that he would not be able to reign over Egypt in happiness or for any great length of time unless he should cut the bodies of all the priests in twain and accompanied by his retinue pass through the very midst of them. And when this dream came again and again, he summoned the priests from all over the land and told them that by his presence in the country he was offending the god, for were that not the case such a command would not be given to him in his sleep. And so he would rather, he continued, departing pure of all defilement from the land, deliver his life to destiny than offend the Lord stain his own life by an impious slaughter, and reign over Egypt. And in the end he returned the kingdom to the Egyptians and retired again to Ethiopia. There being no head of the government in Egypt for two years, and the masses betaking themselves to tumults and the killing of one another, the twelve most important leaders formed a solemn league among themselves. And after they had met together for counsel in Memphis and had drawn up agreements setting forth their mutual goodwill and loyalty, they proclaimed themselves kings. After they had reigned in accordance with their oaths and promises and had maintained their mutual concord for a period of fifteen years, they set about to construct a common tomb for themselves, their thought being that, just as in their lifetime they had cherished a cordial regard for one another and enjoyed equal honors, so also after their death their bodies would all rest in one place, and the memorial which they had erected would hold in one embrace the glory of those buried within. Being full of zeal for this undertaking, they eagerly strove to surpass all preceding rulers in the magnitude of their structure. For selecting a site at the entrance to Lake Moeris in Libya, they constructed their tomb of the finest stone, and they made it in form a square but in magnitude a stayed in length on each side, and in the carvings and indeed in all the workmanship they left nothing wherein succeeding rulers could excel them. For as a man passed through the enclosing wall he found himself in a court surrounded by columns, forty on each side, and the roof of the court consisted of a single stone, which was worked into coffers and adorned with excellent paintings. This court also contained memorials of the native district of each king and of the temples and sacrificial rites therein, artistically portrayed in most beautiful paintings. And in general the kings are said to have made the plan of their tomb on such an expensive and enormous scale that, had they not died before the execution of their purpose they would have left no possibility for others to surpass them, so far as the construction of monuments is concerned. After these kings had reigned over Egypt for fifteen years, it came to pass that the sovereignty devolved upon one man for the following reasons. Semeticus of Sai, who was one of the twelve kings and in charge of the regions lying. Along the sea, furnished wares for all merchants and especially for the Phoenicians and the Greeks and since in this manner he disposed of the products of his own district at a profit and exchanged them for those of other peoples, he was not only possessed of great wealth, but also enjoyed friendly relations with peoples and rulers. And this was the reason, they say, why the other kings became envious and opened war against him. Some of the early historians, however, tell this fanciful story, 
The generals had received an oracle to the effect that the first one of their number to pour a libation from a bronze bowl to the god in Memphis should rule over all Egypt, and when one of the priests brought out of the temple eleven golden bowls, Semeticus took off his helmet and poured the libation from it. Now his colleagues, although suspecting his act, were not yet ready to put him to death, but drove him instead from public life, with orders that he should spend his days in the marshes along the sea. Whether they fell out for this reason, or because of the envy which, as mentioned above, they felt towards him, at any rate Semeticus, calling mercenaries from Caria and Ionia, overcame the others in a pitched battle near the city called Momemphis, and of the kings who opposed him some were slain in the battle and some were driven out into Libya and were no longer able to dispute with him, for the throne. After Semeticus had established his authority over the entire kingdom he built for the god in Memphis the East Propylon and the enclosure about the temple, supporting it with colossi twelve cubits high in place of pillars, and among the mercenaries he distributed notable gifts over and above their promised pay, gave them the region called the Camps to dwell in, and apportioned to them much land in the region lying a little up the river from the Pelusiac mouth, they being subsequently removed thence by Amasis, who reigned many years later, and settled by him in Memphis. And since Sameticus had established his rule with the aid of the mercenaries, he henceforth entrusted these before others with the administration of his empire and regularly maintained large mercenary forces once in connection with a campaign in Syria, when he was giving the mercenaries a more honorable place in his order of battle by putting them on the right wing and showing the native troops less honor by assigning. Them the position on the left wing of the phalanx, the Egyptians, angered by this slight and being over 200,000 strong, revolted and set out for Ethiopia, having determined to win for themselves a country of their own. The king at first sent some of his generals to make excuse for the dishonor done to them, but since no heed was paid to these, he set out in person after them by boat, accompanied by his friends. And when they still continued their march along the Nile and were about to cross the boundary of Egypt, he besought them to change their purpose and reminded them of their temples, their homeland, and of their wives and children. But they, all crying aloud and striking their spears against their shields, declared that so long as they had weapons in their hands, they would easily find homelands and lifting their garments, and pointing to their genitals. They said that so long as they had those, they would never be in want either of wives or of children. After such a display of high courage and of utter disdain for what among other men is regarded as of the greatest consequence, they seized the best part of Ethiopia. And after apportioning much land among themselves, they made their home there. Although Sameticus was greatly grieved over these things, he put in order the affairs of Egypt, looked after the royal revenues, and then formed alliances with both Athens and certain other Greek states. He also regularly treated with kindness any foreigners who sojourned in Egypt of their own free will, and was so great an admirer of the Hellenes that he gave his sons a Greek education. And, speaking generally, he was the first Egyptian king to open to other nations the trading places throughout the rest of Egypt, and to offer a large measure of security to strangers from across the seas for his predecessors in power had consistently closed Egypt to strangers, either killing or enslaving any who touched its shores. Indeed, it was because of the objection to strangers on the part of the people that the impiety of Buziris became a byword among the Greeks. Although this impiety was not actually such as it was described, but was made into a fictitious myth because of the exceptional disrespect of the Egyptians for ordinary customs. Four generations after Sameticus, Apres was king for twenty-two years. He made a campaign with strong land and sea forces against Cyprus and Phoenicia, took Sidon by storm, and so terrified the other cities of Phoenicia that he secured their submission. He also defeated the Phoenicians and Cyprians in a great sea battle, and returned to Egypt with much booty. After this he sent a strong native force against Siren and Barkan, when the larger part of it was lost. The survivors became estranged from him, for they felt that he had organized the expedition with a view to its destruction, in order that his rule over the rest of the Egyptians might be more secure. And so they revolted. The man sent by the king to treat with them, one Amasis, a prominent Egyptian, paid no attention to the orders given him to effect a reconciliation, but, on the contrary, increased their estrangement, joined their revolt, and was himself chosen king. When a little later all the rest of the native Egyptians also went over to Amasis, 
The king was in such straits that he was forced to flee for safety to the mercenaries, who numbered some 30,000 men. A pitched battle accordingly took place near the village of Maria and the Egyptians prevailed in the struggle. Apries fell alive into the hands of the enemy and was strangled to death, and Amasis, arranging the affairs of the kingdom in whatever manner seemed to him best, ruled over the Egyptians in accordance with the laws and was held in great favor. He also reduced the cities of Cyprus and adorned many temples with noteworthy votive offerings. After a reign of fifty-five years he ended his days at the time when Cambyses, the king of the Persians, attacked Egypt in the third year of the sixty-third Olympiad, that in which Parmenides of Camarina won the Stadion. Now that we have discussed sufficiently the deeds of the kings of Egypt from the very earliest times down to the death of Amasis, we shall record the other events in their proper chronological setting, but at this point we shall give a summary account of the customs of Egypt, both those which are especially strange and those which can be of most value to our readers. For many of the customs obtained in ancient days among the Egyptians have not only been accepted by the present inhabitants, but have aroused no little admiration among the Greeks. And for that reason those men who have won the greatest repute in intellectual things have been eager to visit Egypt in order to acquaint themselves with its laws and institutions, which they considered to be worthy of note. For despite the fact that for the reasons mentioned above strangers found it difficult in early times to enter the country. It was nevertheless eagerly visited by Orpheus and the poet Homer in the earliest times and in later times by many others, such as Pythagoras of Samos and Solon the Lawgiver. Now it is maintained by the Egyptians that it was they who first discovered writing and the observation of the stars, who also discovered the basic principles of geometry and most of the arts, and established the best laws. And the best proof of all this, they say, lies in the fact that Egypt for more than 4,700 years was ruled over by kings of whom the majority were native Egyptians, and that the land was the most prosperous of the whole inhabited world, for these things could never have been true of any people which did not enjoy most excellent customs and laws and the institutions which promote culture of every kind. Now, as for the stories invented by Herodotus and certain writers on Egyptian affairs, who deliberately preferred to the truth the telling of marvelous tales and the invention of myths for the delectation of their readers, these we shall omit, and we shall set forth only what appears in the written records of the priests of Egypt, and has passed our careful scrutiny. In the first place, then, the life which the kings of the Egyptians lived was not like that of other men who enjoy autocratic power and do in all matters exactly as they please without being held to account. But all their acts were regulated by prescriptions set forth in laws, not only their administrative acts, but also those that had to do with the way in which they spent their time from day to day, and with the food which they ate. In the matter of their servants, for instance, not one was a slave, such as had been acquired by purchase or born in the home, but all were sons of the most distinguished priests, over twenty years old and the best educated of their fellow countrymen, in order that the king, by virtue of his having the noblest men to care for his person and to attend him throughout both day and night, might follow no low practices, for no ruler advances far along the road of evil until he has those about him who will minister to his passions. And the hours of both the day and night were laid out according to a plan, and at the specified hours it was absolutely required of the king that he should do what the laws stipulated and not what he thought best. For instance, in the morning, as soon as he was awake, he first of all had to receive the letters which had been sent from all sides, the purpose being that he might be able to dispatch all administrative business and perform every act properly, being thus accurately informed about everything that was being done throughout his kingdom. Then, after he had bathed and bedecked his body with rich garments and the insignia of his office, he had to sacrifice to the gods. When the victims had been brought to the altar, it was the custom for the high priest to stand near the king with the common people of Egypt gathered around, and pray in a loud voice that health and all the other good things of life be given the king if he maintains justice towards his subjects. And an open confession had also to be made of each and every virtue of the king the priest saying that towards the gods he was piously disposed and towards men most kindly, for he was self-controlled and just and magnanimous, truthful and generous with his possessions, and, in a word, superior to every desire, and that he punished crimes less severely than they deserved and rendered to his benefactors a gratitude exceeding the benefaction. 
and after reciting much more in a similar vein, he concluded his prayer with a curse concerning things done in error, exempting the king from all blame, therefore, and asking that both the evil consequences and the punishment should fall upon those who served him and had taught him evil things. All this he would do, partly to lead the king to fear the gods and live a life pleasing to them, and partly to accustom him to a proper manner of conduct, not by sharp admonitions, but through praises that were agreeable and most conductive to virtue. After this, when the king had performed the divination from the entrails of a calf, and had found the omens good, the sacred scribe read before the assemblage from out of the sacred book some of the edifying counsels and deeds of their most distinguished men, in order that he who held the supreme leadership should first contemplate in his mind the most excellent general principles, and then turn to the prescribed administration of the several functions. For there was a set time not only for his holding audiences or rendering judgments, but even for his taking a walk, bathing, and sleeping with his wife, and in a word, for every act of his life. And it was the custom for the kings to partake of delicate food, eating no other meat than veal and duck, and drinking only a prescribed amount of wine, which was not enough to make them unreasonably surfeited or drunken and speaking generally, their whole diet was ordered with such continence that it had the appearance of having been drawn up, not by a lawgiver, but by the most skilled of their physicians, with only their health in view. Strange as it may appear that the king did not have the entire control of his daily fare. Far more remarkable still was the fact that kings were not allowed to render any legal decision, or transact any business at random, or to punish anyone through malice or in anger, or for any other unjust reason, but only in accordance with the established laws relative to each offense. And in following the dictates of custom in these matters so far were they from being indignant or taking offense in their souls that, on the contrary, they actually held that they led a most happy life, for they believed that all other men in thoughtlessly following their natural passions commit many acts which bring them injuries and perils, and that oftentimes some who realize that they are about to commit a sin nevertheless do base acts when overpowered by love or hatred or some other passion, while they, on the other hand, by virtue of their having cultivated a manner of life which had been chosen before all others by the most prudent of all men, fell into the fewest mistakes. And since the kings followed so righteous a course in dealing with their subjects, the people manifested a good will towards their rulers which surpassed even the affection they had for their own kinsmen for not only the order of the priests, but, in short, all the inhabitants of Egypt were less concerned for their wives and children and their other cherished possessions than for the safety of their kings. Consequently, during most of the time covered by the reigns of the kings of whom we have a record, they maintained an orderly civil government and continued to enjoy a most felicitous life, so long as the system of laws described was in force, and more than that, they conquered more nations and achieved greater wealth than any other people, and adorned their lands with monuments and buildings never to be surpassed, and their cities with costly dedications of every description. Again, the Egyptian ceremonies which followed upon the death of a king afforded no small proof of the goodwill of the people towards their rulers, for the fact that the honor which they paid was to one who was. Insensible of it constituted an authentic testimony to its sincerity. For when any king died, all the inhabitants of Egypt united in mourning for him, rending their garments, closing the temples, stopping the sacrifices, and celebrating no festivals for seventy-two days, and plastering their heads with mud and wrapping strips of linen cloth below their breasts, women as well as men went about in groups of two or three hundred. And twice each day, reciting the dirge in a rhythmic chant, they sang the praises of the deceased, recalling his virtues, nor would they eat the flesh of any living thing or food prepared from wheat, and they abstained from wine and luxury of any sort. And no one would ever have seen fit to make use of baths or unguents or soft bedding, nay more, would not even have dared to indulge in sexual pleasures. But every Egyptian grieved and mourned during those seventy-two days as if it were his own beloved child that had died. But during this interval they had made splendid preparations for the burial, and on the last day, placing the coffin containing the body before the entrance to the tomb, they set up, as custom prescribed, a tribunal to sit in judgment upon the deeds done by the deceased during his life. And when permission had been given to anyone who so wished to lay complaint against him, the priests praised all his noble deeds one after another. And the common people who had gathered in myriads to the funeral, 
listening to them, shouted their approval if the king had led a worthy life, but if he had not, they raised a clamor of protest. And in fact, many kings have been deprived of the public burial customarily accorded them because of the opposition of the people. The result was, consequently, that the successive kings practiced justice, not merely for the reasons just mentioned, but also because of their fear of the despite which would be shown their body after death and of eternal obloquy. Of the customs, then, touching the early kings, these are the most important. And since Egypt as a whole is divided into several parts which in Greek are called gnomes, over each of these a nomarch is appointed who is charged with both the oversight and care of all its affairs. Furthermore, the entire country is divided into three parts, the first of which is held by the order of the priests, which is accorded the greatest veneration by the inhabitants both because these men have charge of the worship of the gods and because by virtue of their education they bring to bear a higher intelligence than others. With the income from these holdings of land, they perform all the sacrifices throughout Egypt, maintain their assistance, and minister to their own needs, for it has always been held that the honors paid to the gods should never be changed, but should ever be performed by the same men and in the same manner, and that those who deliberate on behalf of all should not lack the necessities of life. For, speaking generally, the priests are the first to deliberate upon the most important matters and are always at the king's side, sometimes as his assistants sometimes to propose measures and give instructions. And they also, by their knowledge of astrology and of divination, forecast future events and read to the king, out of the record of acts preserved in their sacred books, those which can be of assistance. For it is not the case with the Egyptians as it is with the Greeks, that a single man or a single woman takes over the priesthood. But many are engaged in the sacrifices and honors paid the gods and pass on to their descendants the same rule of life. They also pay no taxes of any kind, and in repute and in power are second after the king. The second part of the country has been taken over by the kings for their revenues, out of which they pay the cost of their wars, support the splendor of their court, and reward with fitting gifts any who have distinguished themselves. And they do not swamp the private citizens by taxation, since their income from these revenues gives them a great plenty. The last part is held by the warriors, as they are called, who are subject to call for all military duties. The purpose being that those who hazard their lives may be most loyal to the country because of such allotment of land and thus may eagerly face the perils of war. For it would be absurd to entrust the safety of the entire nation to these men, and yet have them possess in the country no property to fight for valuable enough to arouse their ardor. But the most important consideration is the fact that, if they are well to do, they will readily beget children, and thus so increase the population that the country will not need to call in any mercenary troops. And since their calling, like that of the priests, is hereditary, the warriors are incited to bravery by the distinguished records of their fathers, and, inasmuch as they become zealous students of warfare from their boyhood up, they turn out to be invincible by reason of their daring and skill. There are three other classes of free citizens, namely, the herdsmen, the husbandmen, and the artisans. Now the husbandmen rent on moderate terms the arable land held by the king and the priests and the warriors, and spend their entire time in tilling the soil, and since from very infancy they are brought up in connection with the various tasks of farming, they are far more experienced in such matters than the husbandmen of any other nation, for of all mankind they acquire the most exact knowledge of the nature of the soil, the use of water and irrigation the times of sowing and reaping, and the harvesting of crops in general, some details of which they have learned from the observations of their ancestors and others in the school of their own experience. And what has been said applies equally well to the herdsmen, who receive the care of animals from their fathers as if by a law of inheritance, and follow a pastoral life all the days of their existence. They have received, it is true, much from their ancestors relative to the best care and feeding of grazing animals. But to this they add not a little by reason of their own interest in such matters, and the most astonishing fact is that, by reason of their unusual application to such matters, the men who have charge of poultry and geese, in addition to producing them in the natural way known to all mankind, raise them by their own hands, by virtue of a skill peculiar to them, in numbers beyond telling, for they do not use the birds for hatching the eggs, but in effecting this themselves artificially by their own wit and skill in an astounding manner. They are not surpassed by the operations of nature. Furthermore, 
One may see that the crafts also among the Egyptians are very diligently cultivated and brought to their proper development, for they are the only people where all the craftsmen are forbidden to follow any other occupation or belong to any other class of citizens than those stipulated by the laws and handed down to them from their parents. The result being that neither ill will towards a teacher nor political distractions nor any other thing interferes with their interest in their work. For whereas among all other peoples it can be observed that the artisans are distracted in mind by many things, and through the desire to advance themselves do not stick exclusively to their own occupation, for some try their hands at agriculture, some dabble in trade and some cling to two or three crafts, and in states having a democratic form of government vast numbers of them, trooping to the meetings of the assembly, ruin the work of the government, while they make a profit for themselves at the expense of others who pay them their wage. Yet among the Egyptians, if any artisan should take part in public affairs or pursue several crafts, he is severely punished. Such, then, were the divisions of the citizens, maintained by the early inhabitants of Egypt, and their devotion to their own class which they inherited from their ancestors. In their administration of justice the Egyptians also showed no merely casual interest, holding that the decisions of the courts exercise the greatest influence upon community life, and this in each of their two aspects. For it was evident to them that if the offenders against the law should be punished and the injured parties should be afforded succor, there would be an ideal correction of wrongdoing. But if, on the other hand, the fear which wrongdoers have of the judgments of the courts should be brought to naught by bribery or favor, they saw that the breakup of community life would follow. Consequently, by appointing the best men from the most important cities as judges over the whole land, they did not fall short of the end which they had in mind. For from Heliopolis and Thebes and Memphis they used to choose ten judges from each, and this court was regarded as in no way inferior to that composed of the Areopagites at Athens or of the elders at Sparta. And when the thirty assembled, they chose the best one of their number and made him chief justice, and in his stead the city sent another judge. Allowances to provide for their needs were supplied by the king, to the judges sufficient for their maintenance, and many times as much to the chief justice. The latter regularly wore suspended from his neck by a golden chain a small image made of precious stones, which they called truth. The hearings of the pleas commenced whenever the chief justice put on the image of truth. The entire body of the laws was written down in eight volumes which lay before the judges, and the custom was that the accuser should present in writing the particulars of his complaint, namely, the charge. How the thing happened and the amount of injury or damage done, whereupon the defendant would take the documents submitted by his opponents in the suit and reply in writing to each charge, to the effect either that he did not commit the deed, or if he did that he was not guilty of wrongdoing, or if he was guilty of wrongdoing, that he should receive a lighter penalty. After that, the law required that the accuser should reply to this in writing, and that the defendant should offer a rebuttal. And after both parties had twice presented their statements in writing to the judges, it was the duty of the thirty at once to declare their opinions among themselves, and of the chief justice to place the image of truth upon one or the other of the two pleas which had been presented. This was the manner, as their account goes, in which the Egyptians conducted all court proceedings, since they believed that if the advocates were allowed to speak, they would greatly becloud the justice of a case, for they knew that the clever devices of orators, the cunning witchery of their delivery, and the tears of the accused would influence many to overlook the severity of the laws and the strictness of truth. At any rate, they were aware that men who are highly respected as judges are often carried away by the Eloquence of the advocates, either because they are deceived, or because they are won over by the speaker's charm, or because the emotion of pity has been aroused in them, but by having the parties to a suit present their pleas in writing, it was their opinion that the judgments would be strict, only the bare facts being taken into account, for in that case there would be the least chance that gifted speakers would have an advantage over the slower, or the well-practiced over the inexperienced or the audacious liars over those who were truth-loving and restrained in character, but all would get their just dues on an equal footing, since by the provision of the laws ample time is taken. On the one hand by the disputants for the examination of the arguments of the other side, and on the other hand by the judges for the comparison of the allegations of both parties. Since we have spoken of their legislation, we feel that it will not be foreign to the plan of our history to present such laws of the Egyptians as were especially old, or took on an extraordinary form, or in general can be of help to lovers of reading.
Now, in the first place, their penalty for perjurers was death, on the ground that such men are guilty of the two greatest transgressions, being impious towards the gods and overthrowing the mightiest pledge known among men. Again, if a man, walking on a road in Egypt, saw a person being killed or, in a word, suffering any kind of violence, and did not come to his aid if able to do so, he had to die. And if he was truly prevented from aiding the person because of inability, he was in any case required to lodge information against the bandits and to bring an act against their lawless act, and in case he failed to do this as the law required. It was required that he be scourged with a fixed number of stripes and be deprived of every kind of food for three days. Those who brought false accusations against others had to suffer the penalty that would have been meted out to the accused persons had they been adjudged guilty. All Egyptians were also severally required to submit to the magistrates a written declaration of the sources of their livelihood. And any man making a false declaration or gaining an unlawful means of livelihood had to pay the death penalty. And it is said that Solon, after his visit to Egypt, brought this law to Athens. If anyone intentionally killed a free man or a slave, the laws enjoined that he be put to death. For they, in the first place, wished that it should not be through the accidental differences in men's condition in life, but through the principles governing their actions that all men should be restrained from evil deeds. And, on the other hand, they sought to accustom mankind, through such consideration for slaves, to refrain all the more from committing any offense whatever against freemen. In the case of parents who had slain their children, though the laws did not prescribe death, yet the offenders had to hold the dead body in their arms for three successive days and nights, under the surveillance of a state guard, for it was not considered just to deprive of life those who had given life to their children, but rather by a warning which brought with it pain and repentance to turn them from such deeds. But for children who had killed their parents they reserved an extraordinary punishment, for it was required that those found guilty of this crime should have pieces of flesh about the size of a finger cut out, of their bodies with sharp reeds and then be put on a bed of thorns and burned alive, for they held that to take by violence the life of those who had given them life was the greatest crime possible to man. Pregnant women who had been condemned to death were not executed until they had been delivered. The same law has also been enacted by many Greek states, since they held it entirely unjust that the innocent should suffer the same punishment as the guilty, that a penalty should be exacted of two for only one transgression, and further that, since the crime had been actuated by an evil intention, a being as yet without intelligence should receive the same correction, and what is the most important consideration, that in view of the fact that the guilty had been laid at the door of the pregnant mother, it was by no means proper that the child, who belongs to the father as well as to the mother, should be dispatched. For a man may properly consider judges who spare the life of a murderer to be no worse than other judges who destroy that which is guilty of no crime whatsoever. Now of the laws dealing with murder, these are those which are thought to have been the most successful. Among their other laws, one which concern military affairs, made the punishment of deserters or of any who disobeyed the command of their leaders not death, but the uttermost disgrace. But if later on such men wiped out their disgrace by a display of manly courage, they were restored to their former freedom of speech. Thus the lawgiver at the same time made disgrace a more terrible punishment than death, in order to accustom all the people to consider dishonor the greatest of evils, and he also believed. While dead men would never be of value to society, Men who had been disgraced would do many a good deed through their desire to regain freedom of speech. In the case of those who had disclosed military secrets to the enemy, the law prescribed that their tongues should be cut out. While in the case of counterfeiters or falsifiers of measures and weights or imitators of seals, and of official scribes who made false entries or erased items, and of any who adduced false documents, it ordered that both their hands should be cut off, to the end that the offender, being punished in respect of those members of his body that were the instruments of his wrongdoing, should himself keep until death his irreparable misfortune, and at the same time, by serving as a warning example to others, should turn them from the commission of similar offenses. Severe also were their laws touching women, for if a man had violated a free married woman, they stipulated that he be emasculated, considering that such a person by a single unlawful act had been guilty of the three greatest crimes, assault abduction, and confusion of offspring, 
But if a man committed adultery with the woman's consent, the laws ordered that the man should receive a thousand blows with the rod, and that the woman should have her nose cut off, on the ground that a woman who tricks herself out with an eye to forbidden license should be deprived of that which contributes most to a woman's comeliness. Their laws governing contracts they attribute to Bocorus. These prescribe that men who had borrowed money without signing a bond, if they denied the indebtedness, might take an oath to that effect and be cleared of the obligation. The purpose was, in the first place, that men might stand in awe of the gods by attributing great importance to oaths. For, since it is manifest that the man who has repeatedly taken such an oath will in the end lose the confidence which others had in him, everyone will consider it a matter of the utmost concern not to have recourse to the oath lest he forfeit his credit. In the second place, the lawgiver assumed that by basing confidence entirely upon a man's sense of honor he would incite all men to be virtuous in character, in order that they might not be talked about as being unworthy of confidence, and furthermore, he held it to be unjust that men who had been trusted with a loan without an oath should not be trusted when they gave their oath regarding the same transaction. And whoever lent money along with a written bond was forbidden to do more than double the principal from interest. In the case of debtors, the lawgiver ruled that the repayment of loans could be exacted only from a man's estate, and under no condition did he allow the debtor's person to be subject to seizure, holding that whereas property should belong to those who had amassed it or had received it from some earlier holder by way of a gift, the bodies of citizens should belong to the state. To the end that the state might avail itself of the services which its citizens owed it, in times of both war and peace. For it would be absurd, he felt, that a soldier at the moment perhaps when he was setting forth to fight for his fatherland should be hailed to prison by his creditor for an unpaid loan, and that the greed of private citizens should in this way endanger the safety of all. And it appears that Solon took this law also to Athens, calling it a disburdenment, when he absolved all the citizens of the loans secured by their persons which they owed. But certain individuals find fault, and not without reason, with the majority of the Greek lawgivers, who forbade the taking of weapons and plows and other quite indispensable things as security for loans, but nevertheless allowed the men who would use these implements to be subject to imprisonments. The Egyptian law dealing with thieves was also a very peculiar one, for it bade any who chose to follow this occupation to enter their names with the chief of the thieves and by agreement to bring to him. Immediately the stolen articles, while any who had been robbed filed with him in like manner a list of all the missing articles, stating the place, the day, and the hour of the loss. And since by this method all lost articles were readily found, the owner who had lost anything had only to pay one-fourth of its value in order to recover just what belonged to him. For as it was impossible to keep all mankind from stealing, the lawgiver devised a scheme whereby every article lost would be recovered upon payment of a small ransom. In accordance with the marriage customs of the Egyptians, the priests have but one wife. But any other man takes as many as he may determine, and the Egyptians are required to raise all their children in order to increase the population, on the ground that large numbers are the greatest factor in increasing the prosperity of both country and cities. Nor do they hold any child a bastard, even though he was born of a slave mother. For they have taken the general position that the father is the sole author of procreation and that the mother only supplies the fetus with nourishment and a place to live, and they call the trees which bear fruit male, and those which do not female, exactly opposite to the Greek usage. They feed their children in a sort of happy-go-lucky fashion that in its inexpensiveness quite surpasses belief, for they serve them with stews made of any stuff that is ready to hand and cheap and give them such stalks of the byblos plant as can be roasted in the coals, and the roots and stems of marsh plants, either raw or boiled or baked. And since most of the children are reared without shoes or clothing because of the mildness of the climate of the country, the entire expense incurred by the parents of a child until it comes to maturity is not more than twenty drachmas. These are the leading reasons why Egypt has such an extraordinarily large population, and it is because of this fact that she possesses a vast number of great monuments. In the education of their sons, the priests teach them two kinds of writing, that which is called sacred, and that which is used in the more general instruction. Geometry and arithmetic are given special attention, for the river, by changing the face of the country each year in manifold ways, gives rise to many and varied disputes between neighbors over their boundary lines. 
and these disputes cannot be easily tested out with any exactness unless a geometer works out the truth scientifically by the application of his experience. And arithmetic is serviceable with reference to the business affairs connected with making a living and also in applying the principles of geometry, and likewise is of no small assistance to students of astrology as well. For the positions and arrangements of the stars as well as their motions have always been the subject of careful observation among the Egyptians. If anywhere in the world, they have preserved to this day the records concerning each of these stars over an incredible number of years, this subject of study having been zealously preserved among them from ancient times, and they have also observed with the utmost avidity the motions and orbits and stoppings of the planets, as well as the influences of each one on the generation of all living things, the good or the evil effects, namely of which they are the cause. And while they are often successful in predicting to men the events which are going to befall them in the course of their lives, not infrequently they foretell destructions of the crops or, on the other hand, abundant yields and pestilences that are to attack men or beasts, and as a result of their long observations they have prior knowledge of earthquakes and floods, of the risings of the comets, and of all things which the ordinary man looks upon as beyond all finding out. And according to them the Chaldeans of Babylon, being colonists from Egypt, enjoy the fame which they have for their astrology, because they learn that science from the priests of Egypt. As to the general mass of the Egyptians, they are instructed from their childhood by their fathers or kinsmen in the practices proper to each manner of life as previously described by us. But as for reading and writing, the Egyptians at large give their children only a superficial instruction in them, and not all do this, but for the most part only those who are engaged in the crafts. In wrestling and music, however, it is not customary among them to receive any instruction at all, for they hold that from the daily exercises in wrestling their young men will gain, not health, but a vigor that is only temporary and in fact quite dangerous, while they consider music to be not only useless but even harmful, since it makes the spirits of the listeners effeminate. In order to prevent sicknesses, they look after the health of their bodies by means of drenches, fastings, and emetics, sometimes every day and sometimes at intervals of three or four days. For they say that the larger part of the food taken into the body is superfluous, and that it is from this superfluous part that diseases are engendered, consequently the treatment just mentioned by removing the beginnings of disease, would be most likely to produce health. On their military campaigns and their journeys in the country, they all receive treatment without the payment of any private fee, for the physicians draw their support from public funds and administer their treatments in. Accordance with a written law, which was composed in ancient times by many famous physicians, if they follow the rules of this law as they read them in the sacred book and yet are unable to save their patient, they are absolved from any charge and go unpunished. But if they go contrary to the law's prescriptions in any respect, they must submit to a trial with death as the penalty. The lawgiver holding that but few physicians would ever show themselves wiser than the mode of treatment which had been closely followed for a long period and had been originally prescribed by the ablest practitioners. As regards the consecration of animals in Egypt, the practice naturally appears to many to be extraordinary and worthy of investigation. For the Egyptian venerates certain animals exceedingly, not only during their lifetime but even after their death, such as cats, ichneumons, and dogs, and again, hawks and the birds which they call ebees, as well as wolves and crocodiles and a number of other animals of that kind, and the reasons for such worship we shall undertake to set forth. After we have first spoken briefly about the animals themselves. In the first place, for each kind of animal that is accorded this worship, there has been consecrated a portion of land which returns a revenue sufficient for their care and sustenance. Moreover, the Egyptians make vows to certain gods on behalf of their children who have been delivered from an illness, in which case they shave off their hair and weigh it against silver or gold, and then give the money to the attendants of the animals mentioned. These cut up flesh for the hawks and calling them with a loud cry toss it up to them as they swoop by until they catch it while for the cats and ichneumons they break up bread into milk and calling them with a clucking sound set it before them. Or else they cut up fish caught in the Nile and feed the flesh to them raw, and in like manner each of the other kinds of animals is provided with the appropriate food. And as for the various services which these animals require, the Egyptians not only do not try to avoid them or feel ashamed to be seen by the crowds as they perform them, but on the contrary. 
In the belief that they are engaged in the most serious rites of divine worship, they assume airs of importance, and wearing special insignia make the rounds of the cities and the countryside. And since it can be seen from afar in the service of what animals they engaged, all who meet them fall down before them and render them honor. When one of these animals dies, they wrap it in fine linen and then, wailing and beating their breasts, carry it off to be embalmed, and after it has been treated with cedar oil and such spices as have the quality of imparting a pleasant odor and of preserving the body for a long time, they lay it away in a consecrated tomb. And whoever intentionally kills one of these animals is put to death, unless it be a cat or an ibis that he kills. But if he kills one of these, whether intentionally or unintentionally, he is certainly put to death. For the common people gather in crowds and deal with the perpetrator most cruelly, sometimes doing this without waiting for a trial. And because of their fear of such a punishment, any who have caught sight of one of these animals lying dead withdraw to a great distance and shout with lamentations and protestations that they found the animal already dead. So deeply implanted also in the hearts of the common people is their superstitious regard for these animals, and so unalterable are the emotions cherished by every man regarding the honor due to them that once. At the time when Ptolemy their king had not as yet been given by the Romans the appellation of friend, and the people were exercising all zeal in courting the favor of the embassy from Italy which was then visiting. Egypt and, in their fear, were intent upon giving no cause for complaint or war, when one of the Romans killed a cat and the multitude rushed in a crowd to his house. Neither the officials sent by the king to beg the man off, nor the fear of Rome which all the people felt were enough to save the man from punishment, even though his act had been an accident. And this incident we relate not from hearsay, but we saw it with our own eyes on the occasion of the visit we made to Egypt. But if what has been said seems to many incredible and like a fanciful tale, what is to follow will appear far more extraordinary. Once, they say, when the inhabitants of Egypt were being hard-pressed by a famine, many in their need laid hands upon their fellows. Yet not a single man was even accused of having partaken of the sacred animals. Furthermore, Whenever a dog is found dead in any house, every inmate of it shaves his entire body and goes into mourning, and what is more astonishing than this. If any wine or grain or any other thing necessary to life happens to be stored in the building where one of these animals has expired, they would never think of using it thereafter for any purpose. And if they happen to be making a military expedition in another country, they ransom the captive cats and hawks and bring them back to Egypt. And this they do sometimes even when their supply of money for the journey is running short. As for ceremonies connected with the APIs of Memphis, the In Nevis of Heliopolis and the Goat of Mendes, as well as with the crocodile of the Lake of Moeris, the lion kept in the city of lions, Leontopolis, as it is called, and many other ceremonies like them, they could easily be described, but the writer would scarcely be believed by any who had not actually witnessed them. For these animals are kept in sacred enclosures and cared for by many men of distinction who offer them the most expensive fare, for they provide, with unfailing regularity, the finest wheat and flour or wheat groats seethed in milk, every kind of sweet meat made with honey, and the meat of ducks, either boiled or baked. While for the carnivorous animals birds are caught and thrown to them in abundance, and, in general, great care is given that they have an expensive fare. They are continually bathing the animals in warm water, anointing them with the most precious ointments, and burning before them every kind of fragrant incense. They furnish them with the most expensive coverlets and with splendid jewelry, and exercise the greatest care that they shall enjoy sexual intercourse according to the demands of nature. Furthermore, with every animal they keep the most beautiful females of the same genus, which they call his concubines and attend to at the cost of heavy expense and assiduous service. When any animal dies, they mourn for it as deeply as do those who have lost a beloved child, and bury it in a manner not in keeping with their ability, but going far beyond the value of their estates. For instance, after the death of Alexander and just subsequently to the taking over of Egypt by Ptolemy the son of Lagus, it happened that the APIs in Memphis died of old age, and the man who was charged with the care of him spent on his burial not only the whole of the very large sum which had been provided for the animals maintenance, but also borrowed in addition fifty talents of silver from Ptolemy. And even in our own day some of the keepers of these animals have spent on their burial not less than a hundred talents. There should be added to what has been said what still remains to be told concerning the ceremonies connected with the sacred bull called APIs, 
After he has died and has received a magnificent burial, the priests who are charged with this duty seek out a young bull which has on its body markings similar to those of its predecessor, and when it has been found the people cease their mourning, and the priests who have the care of it first take the young bull to Nilopolis, where it is kept forty days, and then, putting it on a state barge fitted out with a gilded cabin, conduct it as a god to the sanctuary of Hephaestus at Memphis. During these forty days only women may look at it. These stand facing it and pulling up their garments show their genitals, but henceforth they are forever prevented from coming into the presence of this god. Some explain the origin of the honor accorded this bull in this way, saying that at the death of Osiris his soul passed into this animal, and therefore up to this day is always passed into its successors at the times of the manifestation of Osiris. But some say that when Osiris died at the hands of Typhon, Isis collected the members of his body and put them in an ox, booze, made of wood covered over with fine linen, and because of this the city was called Bosiris. Many other stories are told about the APIs, but we feel that it would be a long task to recount all the details regarding them. Since all the practices of the Egyptians in their worship of animals are astonishing and beyond belief, they occasion much difficulty for those who would seek out their origins and causes. Now their priests have on this subject a teaching which may not be divulged, as we have already stated in connection with their accounts of the gods, but the majority of the Egyptians give the following three causes the first of which belongs entirely to the realm of fable and is in keeping with the simplicity of primitive times. They say namely that the gods who came into existence in the beginning being few in number and overpowered by the multitude and the lawlessness of earth-born men, took on the forms of certain animals, and in this way saved themselves from the savagery and violence of mankind. But afterwards, when they had established their power over all things in the universe, out of gratitude to the animals which had been responsible for their salvation at the outset, they made sacred those kinds whose form they had assumed, and instructed mankind to maintain them in a costly fashion while living and to bury them at death. The second cause which they give is this, that the early Egyptians, after having been defeated by their neighbors in many battles because of the lack of order in their army, conceived the idea of carrying standards before the several divisions. Consequently, they say, the commanders fashioned figures of the animals which they now worship and carried them fixed on lances, and by this device every man knew where his place was in the array. And since the good order resulting therefrom greatly contributed to victory, they thought that the animals had been responsible for their deliverance, and so the people, wishing to show their gratitude to them, established the custom of not killing any one of the animals whose likeness had been fashioned at that time, but of rendering to them, as objects of worship, the care and honor which we have previously described. The third cause which they adduce in connection with the dispute in question is the service which each one of these animals renders for the benefit of community life and of mankind. The cow, for example, bears workers and plows the lighter soil. The sheep lamb twice in the year and provide by their wool both protection for the body and its decorous covering. While by their milk and cheese they furnish food that is both appetizing and abundant, Again, the dog is useful both for the hunt and for man's protection, and this is why they represent the god whom they call Anubis with a dog's head, showing in this way that he was the bodyguard of Osiris and Isis. There are some, however, who explain that dogs guided Isis during her search for Osiris and protected her from wild beasts and wayfarers, and that they helped her in her search, because of the affection they bore for her by baying. And this is the reason why, at the festival of Isis, the procession is led by dogs. Those who introduce the rite showing forth in this way the kindly service rendered by this animal of old. The cat is likewise useful against Aespes with their deadly bite and the other reptiles that sting, while the Ecnumon keeps a lookout for the newly laid seed of the crocodile and crushes the eggs left by the female. Doing this carefully and zealously even though it receives no benefit from the act. Were this not done, the river would have become impassable because of the multitude of beasts that would be born. And the crocodiles themselves are also killed by this animal in an astonishing and quite incredible manner, for the Ichnumans roll themselves over and over in the mud. And when the crocodiles go to sleep on the land with their mouths open, they jump down their mouths into the center of their body, then, rapidly gnawing through the bowels, they get out unscathed themselves and at the same time kill their victims instantly. 
and of the sacred birds the ibis is useful as a protector against the snakes, the locusts, and the caterpillars, and the hawk against the scorpions, horned serpents, and the small animals of noxious bite which cause the greatest destruction of men. But some maintain that the hawk is honored because it is used as a bird of omen by the soothsayers in predicting to the Egyptians events which are to come. Others, however, say that in primitive times a hawk brought to the priests in Thebes a book wrapped about with a purple band, which contained written directions concerning the worship of gods and the honors due to them, and it is for this reason, they add, that the sacred scribes wear on their heads a purple band and the wing of a hawk. The eagle also is honored by the Thebans because it is believed to be a royal animal and worthy of Zeus. They have deified the goat, just as the Greeks are said to have honored Priapus, because of the generative member, for this animal has a very great propensity for copulation, and it is fitting that honor be shown to that member of the body which is the cause of generation, being, as it were, the primal author of all animal life. And in general, not only the Egyptians, but not a few other peoples as well have in the rites they observe treated the male member as sacred, on the ground that it is the cause of the generation of all creatures and the priests in Egypt who have inherited their priestly offices from their fathers are initiated first into the mysteries of this god. And both the pans and the satyrs, they say, are worshipped by men for the same reason, and this is why most people set up in their sacred places statues of them showing the phallus erect and resembling a goat's in. Nature, since according to tradition this animal is most efficient in copulation, consequently, by representing these creatures in such fashion, the dedicants are returning thanks to them for their own numerous offspring. The sacred bulls, I refer to the APIs and the Anivis, are honored like the gods, as Osiris commanded, both because of their use in farming, and also because the fame of those who discovered the fruits of the earth is handed down by the labors of these animals to succeeding generations for all time. Red oxen, however, may be sacrificed, because it is thought that this was the color of Typhon, who plotted against Osiris and was then punished by Isis for the death of her husband. Men also, if they were of the same color as Typhon, were sacrificed, they say, in ancient times by the kings at the tomb of Osiris. However, only a few Egyptians are now found red in color. A and but the majority of such are non-Egyptians, and this is why the story spread among the Greeks of the slaying of foreigners by Busiris, although Busiris was not the name of the king but of the tomb of Osiris which is called that in the language of the land. The wolves are honored, they say, because their nature is so much like that of dogs, for the natures of these two animals are little different from each other, and hence offspring is produced by their interbreeding. But the Egyptians offer another explanation for the honor accorded this animal, although it pertains more to the realm of myth, for they say that in early times when Isis, aided by her son Horus, was about to commence her struggle with Typhon, Osiris came from Hades to help his son and his wife, having taken on the guise of wolf, and so, upon the death of Typhon, his conquerors commanded men to honor the animal upon whose appearance victory followed. But some say that once, when the Ethiopians had marched against Egypt, a great number of bands of wolves, Likoi, gathered together and drove the invaders out of the country, pursuing them beyond the city named Elephantine and therefore that gnome was given the name Lycopolite, and these animals were granted the honor in question. It remains for us to speak of the deification of crocodiles, a subject regarding which most men are entirely at a loss to explain how, when these beasts eat the flesh of men, it ever became the law to honor like the gods' creatures of the most revolting habits dead. Their reply is that the security of the country is ensured, not only by the river, but to a much greater degree by the crocodiles in it that for this reason the robbers that infest both Arabia and Libya do not dare to swim across the Nile, because they fear the beasts, whose number is very great, and that this would never have been the case if war were continually being waged against the animals, and they had been utterly destroyed by hunters dragging the river with gnats. But still another account is given of these beasts, for some say that once one of the early kings whose name was Menas being pursued by his own dogs came in his flight to the lake of Moeris as it is called, where, strange as it may seem, a crocodile took him on his back and carried him to the other side. Wishing to show his gratitude to the beast for saving him, he founded a city near the place and named it City of the Crocodiles. And he commanded the natives of the region to worship these animals as gods and dedicated the lake to them for their sustenance. And in that place he also constructed his own tomb, 
erecting a pyramid with four sides, and built the labyrinth which is admired by many. A similar diversity of customs exists according to their accounts, with regard to everything else, but it would be a long task to set forth the details concerning them. That they have adopted these customs for themselves, because of the advantage accruing therefrom to their life, is clear to all from the fact that there are those among them who will not touch many particular kinds of food. Some, for instance, abstain entirely from lentils, others from beans, and some from cheese or onions or certain other foods, there being many kinds of food in Egypt, showing in this way that men must be taught to deny themselves things that are useful, and that if all ate of everything the supply of no article of consumption would hold out. But some adduce other causes and say that, since under the early kings the multitude were often revolting and conspiring against their rulers. One of the kings who was especially wise divided the land into a number of parts and commanded the inhabitants of each to revere a certain animal or else not to eat a certain food, his thought being that, with each group of people revering what was honored among themselves, but despising what was sacred to all the rest, all the inhabitants of Egypt would never be able to be of one mind. And this purpose, they declare, is clear from the results. For every group of people is at odds with its neighbors, being offended at their violations of the customs mentioned above. Some advance some such reason as the following for their deification of the animals. When men, they say, first ceased living like the beasts and gathered into groups, at the outset they kept devouring each other and warring among themselves. The more powerful ever prevailing over the weaker, but later those who were deficient in strength, taught by expediency, grouped together and took for the device upon their standard one of the animals which was later made sacred. Then, when those who were from time to time in fear flocked to this symbol, an organized body was formed which was not to be despised by any who attacked it. And when everybody else did the same thing, the whole people came to be divided into organized bodies. And in the case of each the animal which had been responsible for its safety, was accorded honors like those belonging to the gods, as having rendered to them the greatest service possible. And this is why to this day the several groups of the Egyptians differ from each other, in that each group honors the animals which it originally made sacred. In general, they say, the Egyptians surpass all other peoples in showing gratitude for every benefaction, since they hold that the return of gratitude to benefactors is a very great resource in life for it is clear that all men will want to bestow their benefactions preferably upon those who they see will most. Honorably treasure up the favors they bestow, and it is apparently on these grounds that the Egyptians prostrate themselves before their kings and honor them as being in truth very gods, holding on the one hand. That it was not without the influence of some divine providence that these men have attained to the supreme power and feeling also that such as have the will and the strength to confer the greatest benefactions share in the divine nature. Now if we have dwelt over long on the topic of the sacred animals, we have at least thoroughly considered those customs of the Egyptians that men most marvel at. But not least will a man marvel at the peculiarity of the customs of the Egyptians when he learns of their usages with respect to the dead. For whenever anyone dies among them, all his relatives and friends, plastering their heads with mud, roam about the city lamenting until the body receives burial. Nay more, during that time they indulge in neither baths, nor wine, nor in any other food worth mentioning, nor do they put on bright clothing. There are three classes of burial, the most expensive, the medium, and the most humble. And if the first is used the cost, they say, is a talent of silver, if the second twenty minae, and if the last the expense is, they say, very little indeed. Now the men who treat the bodies are skilled artisans who have received this professional knowledge as a family tradition, and these lay before the relatives of the deceased a price list of every item connected with the burial, and ask them in what manner they wish the body to be treated. When an agreement has been reached on every detail and they have taken the body, they turn it over to men who have been assigned to the service and have become inured to it. The first is the scribe, as he is called, who, when the body has been laid on the ground, circumscribes on the left flank the extent of the incision. Then, the one called the slitter cuts the flesh. As the law commands with an Ethiopian stone and at once takes to flight on the run, while those present set out after him, pelting him with stones, heaping curses on him and trying, as it were, to turn the profanation on his head, 
for in their eyes everyone is an object of general hatred who applies violence to the body of a man of the same tribe or wounds him or, in general, does him any harm. The men called embalmers, however, are considered worthy of every honor and consideration, associating with the priests and even coming and going in the temples without hindrance, as being undefiled. When they have gathered to treat the body after it has been slit open, one of them thrusts his hand through the opening in the corpse into the trunk and extracts everything but the kidneys and heart. And another one cleanses each of the viscera, washing them in palm wine and spices. And in general, they carefully dress the whole body for over thirty days, first with cedar oil and certain other preparations, and then with myrrh, cinnamon, and such spices as have the faculty not only of preserving it for a long time, but also of giving it a fragrant odor. And after treating the body, they return it to the relatives of the deceased, every member of it having been so preserved intact that even the hair on the eyelids and brows remains. The entire appearance of the body is unchanged, and the cast of its shape is recognizable. This explains why many Egyptians keep the bodies of their ancestors in costly chambers and gaze face to face upon those who died many generations before their own birth, so that, as they look upon the stature and proportions and the features of the countenance of each, they experience a strange enjoyment, as though they had lived with those on whom they gaze. When the body is ready to be buried, the family announces the day of interment to the judges and to the relatives and friends of the deceased, and solemnly affirms that he who has just passed away, giving his name, is about to cross the lake. Then, when the judges, forty-two in number, have assembled and have taken seats in a hemicycle which has been built across the lake, the barris is launched, which has been prepared in advance by men especially engaged in that service, and which is in the charge of the boatmen whom the Egyptians in their language call Charon. For this reason they insist that Orpheus, having visited Egypt in ancient times and witnessed this custom, merely invented his account of Hades, in part reproducing this practice and in part inventing on his own account, but this point we shall discuss more fully a little later. At any rate, after the barris has been launched into the lake, but before the coffin containing the body is set in it, the law gives permission to anyone who wishes to arraign the dead person. Now if anyone presents himself and makes a charge, and shows that the dead man had led an evil life, the judges announce the decision to all, and the body is denied the customary burial, but if it shall appear that the accuser has made an unjust charge, he is severely punished. When no accuser appears, or the one who presents himself is discovered to be a slanderer, the relatives put their mourning aside and laud the deceased. And of his ancestry, indeed, they say nothing, as the Greeks do, since they hold that all Egyptians are equally well-born, but after recounting his training and education from childhood, they describe his righteousness and justice after he attained to manhood, also his self-control and his other virtues and call upon the gods of the lower world to receive him into the company of the righteous, and the multitude shouts its assent and extorts the glory of the deceased, as of one who is about to spend eternity in Hades among the righteous. Those who have private sepulchres lay the body in a vault reserved for it, but those who possess none construct a new chamber in their own home, and stand the coffin upright against the firmest wall. Any also who are forbidden burial because of the accusations brought against them, or because their bodies have been made security for a loan they lay away in their own homes. And it sometimes happens that their sons' sons, when they have become prosperous and paid off the debt or cleared them of the charges, give them later a magnificent funeral. It is a most sacred duty in the eyes of the Egyptians that they should be seen to honor their parents or ancestors all the more after they have passed to their eternal home. Another custom of theirs is to put up the bodies of their deceased parents as security for a loan, and failure to repay such debts is attended with the deepest disgrace as well as with deprivation of burial at death. And a person may well admire the men who established these customs, because they strove to inculcate in the inhabitants, as far as was possible, virtuousness and excellence of character, by means not only of their converse with the living, but also of their burial and affectionate care of the dead. For the Greeks have handed down their beliefs in such matters, in the honor paid to the righteous and the punishment of the wicked, by means of fanciful tales and discredited legends. Consequently, these accounts not only cannot avail to spur their people on to the best life, but, on the contrary, being scoffed at by worthless men, are received with contempt. But among the Egyptians, since these matters do not belong to the realm of myth, 
but men see with their own eyes that punishment is meted out to the wicked and honor to the good. Every day of their lives both the wicked and the good are reminded of their obligations, and in this way the greatest and most profitable amendment of men's characters is effected. And the best laws, in my opinion, must be held to be, not those by which men become most prosperous, but those by which they become most virtuous in character and best fitted for citizenship. We must speak also of the lawgivers who have arisen in Egypt and who instituted customs unusual and strange. After the establishment of settled life in Egypt in early times which took place, according to the mythical account, in the period of the gods and heroes the first, they say, to persuade the multitudes to use written laws was Enives, a man not only great of soul but also in his life the most public-spirited of all lawgivers whose names are recorded. According to the tradition he claimed that Hermes had given the laws to him with the assurance that they would be the cause of great blessings, just as among the Greeks, they say. Minos did in Crete and Lycurgus among the Lacedaemonians, the former saying that he received his laws from Zeus and the latter his from Apollo. Also among several other people's tradition says that this kind of a device was used and was the cause of much good to such as believed it. Thus it is recorded that among the Aryans Zathraust is claimed that the good spirit gave him his laws. Among the people known as the Gede who represent themselves to be immortal, Zalmoxis asserted the same of their common goddess Hestia. And among the Jews Moises referred his laws to the god who is invoked as Eau. They all did this either because they believed that a conception which would help humanity was marvelous and wholly divine or because they held that the common crowd would be more likely to obey the laws if their gaze were directed towards the majesty and power of those to whom their laws were ascribed. A second lawgiver, according to the Egyptians, was Sasakis, a man of unusual understanding. He made sundry additions to the existing laws and, in particular, laid down with the greatest precision the rights to be used in honoring the gods and he was the inventor of geometry and taught his countrymen both to speculate about the stars and to observe them. A third one, they tell us, was the king Sesosis, who not only performed the most renowned deeds in war of any king of Egypt, but also organized the rules governing the warrior class, and, in conformity with these, set in order all the regulations that have to do with military campaigns. A fourth lawgiver, they say, was the king Bokoris, a wise sort of a man and conspicuous for his craftiness. He drew up all the regulations which governed the kings and gave precision to the laws on contracts, and so wise was he in his judicial decisions as well, that many of his judgments are remembered for their excellence even to our day. And they add that he was very weak in body and that by disposition he was the most avaricious of all their kings. After Bokoris, they say, their king Amasis gave attention to the laws, who, according to their accounts, drew up the rules governing the nomarchs and the entire administration of Egypt and tradition describes him as exceedingly wise and in disposition virtuous and just, for which reasons the Egyptians invested him with the kingship, although he was not of the royal line. They say also that the citizens of Elis, when they were giving their attention to the Olympic Games, sent an embassy to him to ask how they could be conducted with the greatest fairness, and that he replied, provided no man of Elis participates. And though Polycrates, the ruler of the Samians, had been on terms of friendship with him, when he began oppressing both citizens and such foreigners as put in at Samos. It is said that Amasis at first sent an embassy to him and urged him to moderation, and when no attention was paid to this, he wrote a letter in which he broke up the relations of friendship and hospitality that had existed between them, for he did not wish, as he said, to be plunged into grief in a short while. Knowing right well as he did that misfortune is near at hand for the ruler who maintains a tyranny in such fashion. And he was admired, they say, among the Greeks, both because of his virtuous character and because his words to Polycrates were speedily fulfilled. A sixth man to concern himself with the laws of the Egyptians, it is said, was Darius the father of Xerxes, for he was incensed at the lawlessness which his predecessor, Cambyses, had shown in the treatment of the sanctuaries of Egypt, and aspired to live a life of virtue and of piety towards the gods. Indeed, he associated with the priests of Egypt themselves and took part with them in the study of theology and of the events recorded in their sacred books. And when he learned from these books about the greatness of soul of the ancient kings and about their goodwill towards their subjects, he imitated their manner of life. For this reason, he was the object of such great honor that he alone of all the kings was addressed as a god by the Egyptians in his lifetime. 
While at his death he was accorded equal honors with the ancient kings of Egypt who had ruled in strictest accord with the laws. The system, then, of law used throughout the land was the work, they say, of the men just named, and gained a renown that spread among other peoples everywhere. But in later times, they say, many institutions which were regarded as good were changed, after the Macedonians had conquered and destroyed once and for all the kingship of the native line. But now that we have examined these matters, we must enumerate what Greeks, who have won fame for their wisdom and learning, visited Egypt in ancient times in order to become acquainted with its customs and learning. For the priests of Egypt recount from the records of their sacred books that they were visited in early times by Orpheus, Musaeus, Melampus, and Daedalus, also by the poet Homer and Lycurgus of Sparta, later by Solon of Athens and the philosopher Plato, and that there also came Pythagoras of Samos and the mathematician Eudoxus, as well as Democritus of Abira and Oenopides of Chios. As evidence for the visits of all these men, they point in some cases to their statues and in others to places or buildings which bear their names. And they offer proofs from the branch of learning which each one of these men pursued, arguing that all the things for which they were admired among the Greeks were transferred from Egypt. Orpheus, for instance, brought from Egypt most of his mystic ceremonies, the orgiastic rites that accompanied his wanderings, and his fabulous account of his experiences in Hades, for the rite of Osiris is the same as that of Dionysus and that of Isis very similar to that of Demeter, the names alone having been interchanged, and the punishments in Hades of the unrighteous, the fields of the righteous, and the fantastic conceptions current among the many, which are figments of the imagination, all these were introduced by Orpheus in imitation of the Egyptian funeral customs. Hermes, for instance, the conductor of souls according to the ancient Egyptian custom, brings up the body of the APIs to a certain point, and then gives it over to one who wears the mask of Cerberus. And after Orpheus had introduced this notion among the Greeks, Homer followed it when he wrote, Selenian Hermes then did summon forth the suitors' as souls, holding his wand in hand. And again, a little further on, he says, They passed Oceanus' streams, the gleaming rock, the portals of the sun, the land of dreams, and now they reached the meadow of Asphodel, where dwell the souls, the shades of men outworn. Now he calls the river Oceanus, because in their language the Egyptians speak of the Nile as Oceanus. The portals of the sun, Heliopoli, is his name for the city of Heliopolis, and meadows. The mythical dwelling of the dead is his term for the place near the lake which is called Acarusia, which is near Memphis, and around it are fairest meadows of a marshland and lotus and reeds, the same explanation also serves for the statement that the dwelling of the dead is in these regions, since the most and the largest tombs of the Egyptians are situated there, the dead being ferried across both the river and Lake Acherusha, and their bodies laid in the vaults situated there. The other myths about Hades current among the Greeks also agree with the customs which are practiced even now in Egypt. For the boat which receives the bodies is called Baris, and the passenger's fee is given to the boatman, who in the Egyptian tongue is called Charon. And near these regions, they say, are also the Shades, which is a temple of Hecate, and portals of Cocytus and Lethe, which are covered at intervals with bands of bronze. There are, moreover, other portals, namely, those of Truth, and near them stands a headless statue of Justice. Many other things as well, of which mythology tells, are still to be found among the Egyptians, the name being still preserved and the customs actually being practiced. In the city of Acanthi, for instance, across the Nile in the direction of Libya, 120 stades from Memphis, there is a perforated jar to which 360 priests, one each day, bring water from the Nile, and not far from there the actual performance of the myth of Ochnus is to be seen in one of their festivals, where a single man is weaving at one end of a long rope and many others beyond him are unraveling it. Melampus also, they say, brought from Egypt the rites which the Greeks celebrate in the name of Dionysus, the myths about Cronus and the war with the Titans, and, in a word, the account of the things which happened to the gods. Daedalus, they relate, copied the maze of the labyrinth which stands to our day and was built, according to some, by Mendes, but according to others, by King Maris, many years before the reign of Minos. And the proportions of the ancient statues of Egypt are the same as in those made by Daedalus among the Greeks. The very beautiful propylon of the temple of Hephaestus in Memphis was also built by Daedalus, 
who became an object of admiration and was granted a statue of himself in wood, which was made by his own hands and set up in this temple. Furthermore, he was accorded great fame because of his genius, and, after making many discoveries, was granted divine honors, for on one of the islands off Memphis there stands even to this day a temple of Daedalus, which is honored by the people of that region. And as proof of the presence of Homer in Egypt, they adduce various pieces of evidence, and especially the healing drink which brings forgetfulness of all past evils, which was given by Helen to Telemachus in the home of Menelaus. For it is manifest that the poet had acquired exact knowledge of the nepenthic drug which he says Helen brought from Egyptian Thebes, given her by Polydamma the wife of Thon, for, they allege, even to this day the women of this city use this powerful remedy, and in ancient times, they say, a drug to cure anger and sorrow was discovered exclusively among the women of Diospolis, but Thebes and Diospolis, they add, are the same city. Again, Aphrodite is called golden by the natives in accordance with an old tradition, and near the city which is called Momemphis, there is a plain of golden Aphrodite. Likewise, the myths which are related about the dalliance of Zeus and Hera and of their journey to Ethiopia, he also got from Egypt. For each year among the Egyptians, the shrine of Zeus is carried across the river into Libya and then brought back some days later, as if the god were arriving from Ethiopia. And as for the dalliance of these deities, in their festal gatherings, the priests carry the shrines of both to an elevation that has been strewn with flowers of every description. Lycurgus also, and Plato and Solon, they say, incorporated many Egyptian customs into their own legislation, and Pythagoras learned from Egyptians his teachings about the gods, his geometrical propositions and theory of numbers, as well as the transmigration of the soul into every living thing. Democritus also, as they assert, spent five years among them and was instructed in many matters relating to astrology. Oeonipides likewise passed some time with the priests and astrologers and learned, among other things, about the orbit of the sun, that it has an oblique course and moves in a direction opposite to that of the other stars. Like the others, Eudoxus studied astrology with them and acquired a notable fame for the great amount of useful knowledge which he disseminated among the Greeks. Also of the ancient sculptors, the most renowned sojourned among them, namely Telicles and Theodorus the sons of Rhoecus, who executed for the people of Samos the wooden statue of the Pythian Apollo. For one half of the statue, as the account is given, was worked by Telicles in Samos, and the other half was finished by his brother Theodorus at Ephesus, and when the two parts were brought together they fitted so perfectly that the whole work had the appearance of having been done by one man. This method of working is practiced nowhere among the Greeks, but is followed generally among the Egyptians, for with them the symmetrical proportions of the statues are not fixed in accordance with the appearance they present to the artist's eye, as is done among the Greeks. But as soon as they lay out the stones and after apportioning them are ready to work on them, at that stage they take the proportions, from the smallest parts to the largest. 4. Dividing the structure of the entire body into twenty-one parts and one-fourth in addition, they express in this way the complete figure in its symmetrical proportions. Consequently, so soon as the artisans agree as to the size of the statue, they separate and proceed to turn out the various sizes assigned to them in the same way that they correspond. And they do it so accurately that the peculiarity of their system excites amazement. And the wooden statue in Samos, in conformity with the ingenious method of the Egyptians, was cut into two parts from the top of the head down to the private parts, and the statue was divided in the middle each part exactly matching the other at every point. And they say that this statue is for the most part rather similar to those of Egypt, as having the arms stretched stiffly down the sides and the legs separated in a stride. Now regarding Egypt, the events which history records and the things that deserve to be mentioned, this account is sufficient, and we shall present in the next book. In keeping with our profession at the beginning of this book, the events and legendary accounts next in order— beginning with the part played by the Assyrians in Asia.